It's just I'm going to run the show. It's just going to be me the whole time. And we don't have counselors on this committee. Oh, no, they're coming. Oh, jeez.
Good morning. If I could ask that everyone take their seats, please. Or not. Good morning and welcome to the February 19th, 2019 meeting of the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management. Just so everyone gets used to this for the next four years, I don't do speeches, so we're just going to get straight to the agenda. Uh, declarations of interest, seeing none, confirmation minutes for the meeting of November 22nd, 2018. For those of us that were actually there, we had six of us at the end, so isn't it carried? Carried. I think it's only me and Riley. Um, on to the agenda. <laughs> Item number one, uh, terms of reference for the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management. I know Councilor Edgar had a couple questions. Do you want to do that now? Uh, sure, I can. Um, actually, it's... Uh, it's more of a, well, I guess it's a question slash direction for staff. Um, in reviewing the terms of reference, I'm not sure who I direct this to, staff-wise. Clerk's office. Caitlin, Salter and Donald. Um, so um, under the uh, specific responsibilities, what I would uh, like to direct staff to do is add in, review and make recommendations to council with regard to pollinating species such as bees and butterflies. It's something that uh, is already being worked on. The chair and I have discussed it. Um, the mayor has certainly spoken about the B side of things as well. And I just think it sends a message that the city is taking it very seriously. And we do have a report coming forward in this, uh, this year on, on the issues. So I thought it'd be helpful if that was added to the terms of reference. Mr. Chair, if the, the member uh, would like to have that moved as a motion, we can ensure it's formalized in the terms of reference as they rise to council. Okay, if it has to be a motion, sure, we can do that. Yep. Um, so I'll move that as a motion, and I'll write the motion up after the fact. Um, sure. If that's okay, but the, the, um, the be it resolved would be for uh, staff to review and make recommendations to council with regard to pollinating species such as bees and butterflies. Yeah. On that motion? Okay. okay, thank you very much. Thanks. The report, the report will be coming to uh, this committee in April, so we'll be talking about that, so it's good to get that. In the, in the agenda, sort on the terms of reference. So on the, uh, that the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management recommend Council approve its terms of reference as outlined in this report and attaches document one as amended. Sure. Carried, thank you. Item number two, status updates, inquiries and motions for the period ending February 7th, 2019 at the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management received this report for information. Is that item received? Received. Item number three is the appointments to the Environmental Stewardship Advisory Committee. I don't need to really read the thing. Uh, that the f on this? No. So we do, so we, in addition to the members of the committee, we also have a motion from the vice chair to appoint himself as the uh, liaison for the committee for this term of council. So I'll go ahead with the motion. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair, I won't go through the whereas clauses, but the be it resolved that the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management appoint Councillor Sean Menard to serve as its liaison member for the 2018-2022 term of council. So yeas and nays on that, because I imagine it's going to be unanimous against. No, I'm sorry. Um, so on that motion? Carried. Carried. Thank you. And on the, uh, on the item to add, or to, uh, to name the panel, or sorry, to name the members of the committee for the Environmental Stewardship Advisory Committee, is that carried? Carried. Thank you. Congratulations, Bill. Welcome back. Before we uh, get to the next item, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure. Uh, I wanted to lift the IPDB up. Uh, yeah, we're going to do that. Don't okay. worry. Okay. Item four is the draft operating budget. We are going to, and capital budget, we're going to hold that for presentation and speakers. Um, we have an additional item 
Councillor Eglai had an item that he wanted to put on the, and ask you to do that now. To be added as item number five. Yeah, so it's a motion that uh, I'm going to be um, adding. Now, uh, Chair, is, is this a motion that we talked about regarding the dividend? Do you want me to speak? It would be the motion on the, uh, the stump removal, the stump grinding for private property. Okay, thank you. And if you give me one second, clerk staff has copies of all the motions, so. I'm just going to grab a copy. First off, I just want to waive the rules to, uh, to add this item. It's, it's, it's about um, stump grinding on private property as it relates to the tornado or windstorm damage uh, from September 21st. Yeah, so I'll just read it really. Uh, I think Can obviously. Can we just add the item? Carrie? Okay. Carrie, right, go ahead with the item. Okay, um, so uh, I think we're all aware obviously of the tornado and the damage that it did, especially uh, uh, from a tree perspective in, uh, in Trent Arlington. Um, the city has done a number of things to uh, get financial assistance to deal with the uh, issue of uh, stump grinding or removal. Um, this is something that the city doesn't typically uh, cover, especially on private property. Uh, it's also something that we found out the hard way that insurance companies don't generally cover unless the tree that came down actually did damage to your property. So if the tree came down and hit your house, um, there would be coverage to deal with the tree. If the tree simply came down and didn't hit anything, then there's no coverage. So the motion uh, is... Uh, Therefore, be it resolved, the staff provide a plan to community, uh, uh, sorry, to uh, uh, to this committee um, in the spring of 2019 to offer support to affected residents for stump grinding on private property through partnerships with NGO Alliance members and or corporate partners, and be it further resolved that the city use any remaining funding provided by the province to assist with the recovery efforts to support a program for stump grinding on private property. Thank you very much. Any questions on the item? Oh. Is, do we have staff here that can get into stump grinding questions? Uh, yes, I've talked it over with uh, Kevin okay. uh, Wiley, who's here. And uh, I should also point out that staff is supportive of, so of this motion. My, my questions are for staff. Um, can staff just talk about, I know Councillor Agway talked about, it's more of a um, homeowner responsibility if, if the need of stump grinding is on private property. <laughs> Councillor is talking about two things. One is to come back with a plan on how the city is going to coordinate with partners in the community, but also that if there's funding left over, um, that we use that funding. So can staff just talk about that briefly? Is, first of all, is there funding left over? Are there any funds available that can be tapped into for this service? And two, can staff just very briefly, because I know we're asking for a plan to come back, but um, how have private homeowners received service to date for stump grinding? Uh, who are they going to and how can the city help out? Chair, I'll have Lila Gibbons answer the questions. Hi, through the chair. Um, the first question I believe was, is there additional funding that's left over for the province? Uh, at this time, there is some additional funding that's left over. Uh, we did have to cut our operations uh, short this uh, this past fall because of the early snowfall. So we do have some continued plans in terms of uh, cleanup efforts uh, and uh, efforts along the city's right of way and parks. But we do believe there will be some additional funds that we can help support um, through our NGO Alliance memberships, uh, some of the work that can continue to happen on private property. Uh, second question I believe was in terms of uh, what have residents been doing at this point in time. Uh, in terms of stump grinding, I don't believe there's been a significant amount of work as most of the concentration was happening on uh, safety sensitive items where it was removal of trees and wood debris from property. Uh, that is a piece that is going to become full force this spring because there are many residents in the uh, tornado affected areas that are looking to replant. Uh, so there will have to be some work that's done on their properties. Understanding that it's stump grinding, not stump removal, uh, where you're bringing the, um, uh, the stump down to about uh, six to eight inches below grade uh, and then filling. 
And I, I think I can help a little bit in terms of what residents have been doing thus far, if you want to, you okay? All right, thank you very much, Councillor Bockington. On the motion from Councillor Aguilar? Carried. Carried, thank you. And there are two items, uh, information previously distributed. One is the annual drinking water source protection status updates. The other is the urban forest management plan 2018 update and 2019-2022. This is an item that previous term of council had asked for a report on. Uh, it's here as, as merely an item, uh, but I think we want to actually get a presentation on that. So Councillor Menard has a, has a motion to add that to the agenda. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. So it's just to add IPDB, the Urban Forest Management Plan update and implementation uh, to our agenda for discussion. On the motion to add the item to the agenda? Carried. Carried, so that'll be item number six. And we'll hold that, we'll get to that after the budgets. So back to item number four, which is the 2019 draft operating capital budget tax and rate supported for our committee. I can just ask staff to come and provide a presentation. We'll do a presentation from staff and then we'll move to delegations. At this point, we have seven delegations. You have five minutes. No, I'm just joking. In conclusion, no. good morning. Um, we're here to uh, present the draft 2019 tax and rate budget to the uh, Environmental Protection Water Wastewater Standing Committee. With me today, uh, Alan Gonche will be presenting some of the slides, and Isabel Jasmine will be presenting some of the financial slides. And to my left is Megan uh, Michi. She will be making sure we stay on track. So the focus of today's presentation will be review of the tax operating and capital budgets and review of the rate operating and capital budgets. Uh, the draft supported budget being presented to you today includes the following areas of review infrastructure services, resiliency and natural systems, solid waste services, and forestry. The budget is broken down into proposed expenditures, recoveries, and revenue. It also highlights the overall changes since 2018. In total, the proposed tax supported budget for environment protection, water and wastewater management is 128.8 million towards infrastructure services, 31.4 million, resiliency and natural systems policy, 1.5 million, solid waste services, 77.2 million, and forestry services, 18.6 million. This, re this represents an increase of 4.4 million in gross expenditures from 2018. 2.2 million more in net expenditures um, as reflected in the chart. The increase in infrastructure services includes seven new full-time equivalent staff for growth primarily in the capital program for facilities. Some of the key highlights of the proposed budget include all programs to include adjustment for, for 2019 cost of living increments and benefit adjustments. Inflation and growth increases to curbside and multi-residential garbage recycling and green bin collection contracts. An increase in the solid waste fee for single family and multi-residential households by $2 and $1 respectfully, respectively. And upon approval of the budget, solid waste fees will increase by $2 to $88 per household for curbside collection and by $1 to $43 per household for multi-residential collection. On the tax capital budget, $15 million is earmarked for solid waste assets and initiatives of which will come back of which will come from the capital reserve fund and revenue. This includes $450,000 for solid waste fleet to purchase three pickup trucks and a backhoe and a roll-off truck for use at Trail Road. $7.6 million for landfill disposal capping stage two, and this is the second of three phases of the final cap on stage two. $2 million for Spring Hill landfill for the design and of an impermeable cap and stormwater management system. 
These funds will be recovered as per the management agreement. $550,000 for the Nepean landfill cap repair, which is ongoing maintenance. $2.25 million for trail road regulatory work. This includes the trail road gas collection system expansion. $1 million for landfill disposal stage five. And this is for the, to start the EA on stage five, which is the final stage of the landfill. $900,000 for long-term planning, which will be used to kickstart the solid waste master plan refresh, and you'll be getting a report, a roadmap report later this year in the summer. Other notable initiatives totaling $3.15 million include $150,000 for energy evolution. This includes projects like the electrical charging stations, waste heat survey, and biogas bio feasibility survey. $3 million for energy management and investment strategy. Major projects include adding building automated systems to 30 facilities that currently don't have it, upgrading more of the city to LED lighting, and adding an electric boiler at uh, Walter Baker. In order to accomplish the initiatives identified in the capital tax budget, the draft 2019 budget will draw on $16.2 million from the capital reserve fund and $2 million from revenue. So now we transition to the uh, draft rate budget. Uh, the rate budget includes three main service areas, water services, wastewater services, and stormwater services. Uh, the total uh, replacement value for the assets that are supporting the services uh, is estimated at over $21 billion, which uh, represents about half of the city's uh, overall infrastructure assets. So these are um, asset-intensive uh, services, um, and basically a large percentage of the rate increase identified in this budget uh, are to address uh, capital renewal investments. So key assets uh, that are used to support drinking water services includes approximately 3,000 kilometers of water mains, two water purification plants, uh, seven pumping stations. In terms of wastewater services, um, about 2,700 kilometers of sewers and combined sewers, uh, one wastewater treatment plant and 65 pumping stations. And then finally, in terms of stormwater, uh, approximately 2,700 kilometers of sewers, uh, more than 5,800 uh, culverts, uh, 375 stormwater facilities, including 27 in the rural areas. And uh, as was, was noted in the 2017 study of the asset report, a uh, number of stormwater assets, including large sewer pipes and culverts, are in need of renewal. Uh, these are critical assets um, that are required to ensure continued serv service and reduce the risk of flooding. And as, as we'll be discussed in this presentation, these investments are driving higher percentage rate increases. So the proposed rate uh, supported operating budget for EPWWM allocates 404 million towards drinking water, 186.4 million, wastewater, 163 million, and stormwater, 54.5 million. Because these are capital intensive services, over half of the expenditure budget goes towards a contribution to capital, approximately 160 million, and the debt servicing cost of 55 million for debt issued on capital projects that have been completed. All programs include an adjustment for potential uh, 2019 cost of living increments and benefit adjustments. The contribution to capital includes a portion for inflation and an increase to the contribution to capital to address the infrastructure gap. The LRFP increase for water is 1.4 million, wastewater 2.4 million, and stormwater is 4.5 million. The remainder of those amounts of the increases goes towards inflation. The 2017 LRFP identified an annual funding gap of approximately 40 million in total to be addressed within five years. The new rate structure and rate, rate increases will take effect on April 1st. For an average urban residential home that receives a water bill, the overall average increase is $36, $36 annually or $3 per month. And for the average rural non-connected single family home, the increase is $4.40 for the year or 37 cents per month. Between 2019 and 2022, 
the proposed budget forecasts 681.7 million to renew and grow water, wastewater, and stormwater infrastructure. For 2019, 44.4 million is for drinking water infrastructure, 84.8 million for the rate portion of integrated roads, water, and wastewater, 21.2 million for, um, sorry, for integrated uh, water and wastewater infrastructure, 38.7 for stormwater infrastructure, and 74.8 million for wastewater infrastructure. So I'm gonna to speak to a couple of slides that uh, summarize uh, some of the key investment um, on this slide without going through all the specifics. Um, in terms of water infrastructure, we're looking at uh, 44.2 million uh, of investments. Uh, and also 21.2 million for water and sewer type investments. Uh, what's also important to note that was identified in the previous slide as part of the Transportation Committee budget, there's also 109 million uh, of investments for integrated road, water, sewer uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, in terms of stormwater infrastructure, we're looking at investments of about 38.7 million. Uh, of that, uh, over 16 million is for the renewal of drainage culverts, of which uh, 12 million is being invested in uh, rural wards. And we also have nearly 75 million uh, for wastewater related uh, investments. And then finally, in terms of the capital funding source, uh, draft budget 2019 allocates 263.9 million to renew and grow city infrastructure. Uh, this includes 32.8 million for development charges, uh, drawing 155.7 million from the capital reserve and taking on 75 million of debt. That brings to conclusion. Thank you very much. So I mentioned we are gonna go to um, delegations before we get to questions to staff. I do want to just, there is a technical amendment. I just want to ask Councilor Menard to introduce first, just on a couple of pages um, from the budget, so go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So whereas the 2019 draft budget includes integrated roads, water, and wastewater capital projects that are funded partially through the Transportation Committee budget, the roads portion, <clears throat> and partially through the rate supported budget, and, and whereas while these projects were included in the Transportation Committee budget book, but the rate supported funding for these integrated water and wastewater projects were inadvertently omitted from the rate supported budget book that was tabled at Council and is before the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management. Therefore, it be resolved that the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management receive and consider the attached amended pages of the draft 2019 Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management rate supported budget as follows. The amended pages 23 to 25B, that's the capital funding summary, and amended pages 115 to 119B, capital forecast summary. Thank you very much, Councilor Menard. So on that motion. Carried. Thank you. Um, just before we get, to, uh, just one quick thing, just because it's fresh in the mind of the, with the two last slides, the reserves. Can you just remind us and those in the room how much we take from reserves annually from the budget, but also how much in a separate part of the budget we put right back in? Um, so the contribution to reserves is 160 million with all three services combined. Right. Thanks. So it's it's. It ends up almost being, we, we take out reserves. So it looks, because the optics are, it looks like we just raid reserves to fund this stuff. But the reality is, we put a bunch of money into reserves at the end of the year as well. So what goes into reserves at the end of the year is any surpluses? Right. Yeah, and uh, any deficits would also be covered by reserves. But er, yes, every, as part of the operating budget, we put money aside two reserves and that's the cash portion that helps to fund capital projects is also debt that's a, a, a used to, to fund projects too all right thank you. Um, so on to our delegations our first delegation today is Aaron Andrews Let's just play up to the space here on the on your left side of the table And next up will be Eric Schiller. So, Ms. Andrews, you have uh, five minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. 
My name is Erin Andrews. I'm from Ottawa, and I'm a member of the Healthy Transportation Coalition. I'm concerned about the global climate crisis that we're facing, and in this context, we need to think seriously about our emissions as a city and focus on making our transit service work for everyone in Ottawa. Some of you are involved in the Transit Commission, some of you are not. But as members of the Environment and Climate Protection Committee, please don't allow the silos that are created by City Hall to keep you from thinking about these important environmental issues. I first learned about the Healthy Transportation Coalition in 2015 when I applied to work with them on, as a summer student. At that time, one of my main projects was researching options for low-income bus passes and circulating a petition asking the City of Ottawa to implement one. We were able to collect over 3,000 signatures and our campaign was a huge success, ultimately leading to the Equipass, which now exists. I was thrilled. But the cost of the Equipass, a 50% reduction from the regular monthly pass, is still very high. At $58.25 per month, it still represents a major expense and a barrier to many people. I graduated from my master's program in March and have struggled to find a, a good job since then. To me and many others, the cost of transit makes a big difference in my life. I didn't buy a monthly pass for February because I could save a few dollars from the fewer trips I take, a function of the pass lasting for the calendar month rather than 30 days. Until very recently, I relied exclusively on transit to get around the city. It took me an hour and 45 minutes at best to travel from my home in Heron Park to where my parents lived in Pineview, though only a 15 minute drive. The trip required me to take or, uh, two or even three buses. I now have a car that I bought for a very low price and sometimes I drive to places that I might otherwise bus to because gas is so cheap and bus fare is so expensive. These are choices that regular people are making every day because the buses are inconvenient, the cost of transit in the city is so high. Sometimes I drive because if I don't, I simply can't make it to my work and appointments, a struggle that many of you faced during the transit challenge. I'm fortunate in being able to afford this option, but many people can't. The problem here is twofold. First, the transit system is inequitable. The draft budget for 2019 includes a fare hike of 2.5% for all transit fares, including low income passes. The cost of transit already excludes many from using it, and raising the fares will only compound the problem. We must freeze fares to ensure that everyone can access transit to be able to get around. But secondly, the transit system does not provide adequate service. If we want to reduce our emissions and become a cleaner, greener city, we need a transit system that meets our needs. We need a transit system that is extensive and reliable enough that even those who could afford to drive will choose not to. We've achieved this in some areas. Many who can afford to live near the transitway and work downtown choose to take transit for their commutes, but this isn't enough. To reduce congestion and fight climate change, we need better local connections to transit so people live, living further from the transitway and light rail are also well serviced. And we need better connections between suburbs where lower income people tend to live and where lower paying jobs tend to be located. To this end, we need two key actions. We need to freeze the low income fares immediately. It would only cost $105,000 out of 2019's $3.6 billion budget. Um, and in the past week, more than 90 people have emailed the mayor and their councillors to call for this freeze. This is something we can and must do in the short term. Secondly, we must invest in transit service to underserved areas. We must strengthen connections to rapid transit in places like Vanier, like Greenboro East and Carlington, in communities without light rail service, and especially in low-income neighborhoods. The City of Ottawa has an equity and inclusion lens that should be applied to all its areas in work. It's meant to be applied, but each of you has to think about what this means for you as members of this committee. We need an equitable and inclusive city where transit is affordable for everyone and serves everyone's needs, not just those who work downtown. You have a responsibility to ensure that Ottawa is equitable and inclusive. Transit services are critical for environmental and climate protection, and as decision makers for this city, you must act to ensure that the our transit system works for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So I do appreciate you taking the time to come here. Um, you don't feel that this is the appropriate delegation for this committee? Uh, well, it isn't. Uh, I mean, we, we have terms of reference for each committee. So this committee actually couldn't take any action on what you said. Um, but the Transit Commission does meet tomorrow. 
and they, dis they discuss their budget tomorrow. And I will be speaking there as well. Perfect. But I want to bring up these issues because I, I want to see how different committees can think about ways that they can affect this type of change to make Ottawa more equitable. And many of you are on those committees, and so I'm trying to take every opportunity possible to make sure that these issues are at the, are at the fore of your minds. Well, I fully understand that. And we're all city councillors, and we all have a role in every single one of these committees, and we all make decisions at the end of the day on the entire budget. Um, but just in terms of what we can actually do here, we any motion that would come forward based on your presentation would actually be out of order. But I do appreciate you coming. I didn't want to cut you off because you did take the time to come here and I appreciate that. Do you have a question, Councilor Minard? Just really quickly, and I, I do see the overlap obviously between climate change and our transit system. It's one of the major um, emissions outputs that we have as a city is our transit fleet. Uh, and we haven't been moving to electric vehicles as an example. Um, and fares, of course, play into how many people take, take rides. Um, you mentioned $105,000 uh, figure for freezing uh, the, the Equipass, pass, Access the Pass, and yes. Community Pass. Um, are you aware of how much it would cost to freeze transit fares across the board to encourage more trips? I'm not currently aware of that figure. Okay. Are you? It's a it's about 0.8 percent on the transit levy. Uh, okay. An additional 0.8 percent on the transit levy. So it, it's fair. It's very small for the rest of 2019. Appreciate you coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Mr. Eric Schiller. Good morning. First of all, uh, this uh, talk will be videotaped. I've been advised that this is permissible here. Do you have waivers? I need to sign a waiver. I don't want to be any unlawful videos. No, I'm just joking. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Eric Schiller. I'm a water engineer. I'm a retired professor of water resources engineering at the University of Ottawa. I'm here as a member of the Ottawa Water Study Action Group, otherwise known as OSAG. And for about 12 years, we've been working on the issue of municipal tap water and bottled water. And I'd like to tell you, uh, talk about this for a few minutes. First of all, since you're all members of the Environmental Committee, I'm assuming you all realize that single-use plastics are presenting a, a terrible environmental problem. Despite all our efforts to recycle these things, the majority of them, these plastic containers, end up in the environment, in the soil, or in the ocean. Right now, masses of plastic are accumulating in, the, in islands in the, in the ocean. And if we keep doing this, by the year 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish by weight. Now, meanwhile, here in Ottawa, our water supply system, which you, your policy governs, is supplying excellent quality water at a very reasonable price. Um, in fact, I could say that the water coming out of a, a tap is as good a, as or better than the water in plastic bottles. A recent study in McGill uh, last year on five major water corporations studied the quality of their water and in 30 out of 50 of the cases there was found to be microplastics in the water in plastic bottles. So we can safely say the water in your tap is good as good as or sometimes better than the water in a plastic bottle. Uh, now, another thing to look at is the, the cost of uh, these, uh, the water in the plastic bottle. Uh, the cost of your water coming out of the tap, you can take a whole liter and the cost is a quarter of a cent. I went downstairs this morning and looked at the Aquafina bottle. For a half a liter, you pay $2.20. That means that the water in a plastic bottle is 1,700 times more than the cost of the excellent water coming out of your tap. Um, there's something wrong here. And what's wrong is that the, the rates of uh, buying water in plastic bottles is increasing. And one in five Canadians drinks all of their water from plastic bottles. Why am I talking to you? Because you are in charge of setting policy about uh, municipal tap water. And I, uh, as, as a member of uh, OSAG, we, are, we have two goals. One is 
to wake the public up about this. This is incredible. When you think of the environmental damage that's being done and the fact that last year alone, the sales of water and plastic bottles went up, not down. Um, so, wake up the, the, the public, but two, encourage the city to be more aggressive in promoting their own good tap water. Uh, and there are two things you could do here. One is, whenever you have an event and you supply water, do not supply water in plastic bottles. Supply water from the tap in reusable containers. This has not always been done. Most of the time you do it. That's good. And in fact, let me, let me com compliment you for uh, trying to do something in this regard. You have tried to put in, and uh, you have put in more water fountains. You've, uh, a number of years ago, put money into this, and there was some prom promotion about tap water. But uh, we're not winning the game. The second thing we strongly recommend that you do is to stop selling water in plastic bottles in your own municipal buildings. Now listen, Vancouver has done this. Toronto has done this. As we speak, Montreal is doing this. And PEI is having an aggressive a campaign against plastic uh, containers of all kinds. Now why would you stop selling plastic uh, bottled water? One, it will be a tremendous uh, teaching uh, method. When people realize, oh, the city of Ottawa has stopped selling plastic water bottles. Why did they do that? Because they're trying to promote their own better quality, lower cost water. It seems obvious. Uh, here's, what we, here's what we are uh, pleading with you. When these contracts, and there are contracts held by Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola and others to sell this in your buildings, when they come to uh, expiry, we're asking you to say no more sale of plastic water bottles in municipal buildings. Why would you do that? Because of all the containers, all the single use pl plastic I'd containers. Ask you to please wrap up, sir. The, the water is the most obvious. So please, here's the suggestion. When the, ex the contracts expire, the city of Ottawa will no longer uh, sell plastic uh, water bottles in the municipal buildings. This is the capital of Canada. This will send a message. Please do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just uh, bear with us a second. I, I know we do have a report coming to this committee in the near future on single-use plastics. Um, so we will talk about this in the future. Uh, Councillor Cloutier had some comments. Dr. Schiller, thank you very much. I know we've met about this, and thank you for highlighting the, uh, the extraordinary quality, the world-class quality of Ottawa water. There are hundreds of thousands of tests every year that the city undertakes to keep the water safe. And the, the issue is, I, I am fully on board with, with adjusting the contracts when they come due. The issue is that often water is the healthiest option that is sold in, in the vending machines. Of, of, of all the products that are sold in there. Water is the healthiest. So I think what's important, I have spoken with Dan Shenye about this, about inventorying our water fountains in our community centers to make sure that that water is available. Mm -hmm. And then the issue becomes how to ensure that, uh, how to try and encourage people to bring their own water bottles. But an option, and I have discussed this with Councillor Bernard, who I know is very interested in it, um, is, m might be to, to encourage Coke or whomever holds the contract to sell uh, reusable bottles from their vending machine. They could do so at the same price because you know the cost, the marginal cost of water is a quarter of a cent you said or, or it's neg negligible. It's the shipping, it's the product, it's the production that, that is where the cost is. We can encourage Coke to sell reusable water bottles and that could then be quickly, immediately filled up at the, at the fountain adjacent to the vending machine, that would be a solution and that would highlight the, um, the, the, the problem, the, uh, the opportunity, if I might, the opportunity that, that is before us. So thank you for your work on this. 
I yes, that it. solution would be uh, one answer, and the corporations that sell bottled water would like that. But there is a better solution, and that's the supply of excellent municipal tap water coming out of your tap in every home. Absolutely. And that's the better solution. And, and, and that that be available at our arenas, our community yeah. centers, and, yeah. and fully available. More fountains, more water fountains, yeah. Thank you, Councillor Gucci. Councillor McKinney? Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for coming out. I really uh, appreciate your presentation, and uh, it is uh, something that we absolutely have to take seriously. We've got to get plastic bottles out of City Hall. It's ridiculous that we have them. Um, so I'm either going to be able to, I either want to ask staff some very specific questions or it will come as uh, an inquiry. I guess I'll, I'll put it out there, the questions that I want uh, answered, and then maybe we could decide or staff can decide whether that should come as an inquiry or if they can answer it uh, when we go to staff questioning. But I want to know specifically what are the lengths of the contracts, um, what is the annual revenue, where does it go um, in, within the, the city budget, and what is our annual budget to promote our city water. So those are the four questions I like answered either today or um, as a result of an inquiry because uh, I think I'm quite serious and uh, I think several of my colleagues that uh, it's actually an embarrassment that we sell uh, bottled water in the city of Ottawa facilities and uh, it has to stop and we do it only uh, to make money to fill our budget holes so we'll have to find that money somewhere else but it certainly cannot come at the expense of the environment so I thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you that does sound like an inquiry. I uh, don't think anyone has those exact answers right now. We sure, I think, I think Mr. Chenier is able to answer most of those questions today. All right, well, we can get to it later then, because we want to keep on going through the delegations. Mr. Schiller, thank you very much. Thank you. Our third speaker is Mr. Bill Egerton. He was officially my boss. And Emma Coulter will be next. Comments on the draft budget from your now former Environmental Stewardship Advisory Committee will be brief for two reasons. The election cycle meant that we did not receive the detailed staff briefing which we enjoyed last year. And more importantly, the level of funding for activities relevant to ESAC's mandate is very low. Realistically, we did not expect a municipal new green deal, but in light of recent weather here and political developments in Toronto and Washington, we had hoped that Ottawa's new civic leaders would be far more active on the environmental file. Half of carbon emissions are under the direct or indirect influence of municipalities, and the UN Climate Panel warns that there are less than three terms of council left before our planet potentially goes down the toilet. It then becomes wastewater. And sorry, that was a bad pun. ESAC understands your desire to keep taxes low, but we would have liked to see more funding to deal with local environmental issues, ranging from invasive species to winter cycling and pedestrian pathways, from boosting infrastructure that supports the environment to, to tapping into FCM green funds, since we were completely shut out again from the latest round. You have allocated money for tree planting, but much of that will simply replace the forest cover destroyed by our recent tornado, which leaves minor incremental carbon sequestration or stormwater absorption. We hope that proposed funding for road resurfacing is sufficient to avoid diverting the surplus from Hydro Ottawa to fill potholes again, and that this year's surplus from Hydro Ottawa will go towards activities which are a little bit greener than asphalt. Although at a much lower level, you have allocated $150,000 to energy evolution, but no action plan will emerge until later this year. You propose $3 million to retrofit municipal buildings for energy efficiency, but your green building policy never mentioned retrofits. In both 2017 and 2018, ESAC formally recommended that older city buildings also be included, so if this inclusion is due to our persistent whining, thank you very much for listening, but please read the five other recommendations on improving energy in municipal buildings. So ESAC would like to table five comments with this standing committee for consideration. Some are not directly or completely under your terms of reference, but they all have a very clear environmental focus. This draft budget contains record funding for affordable housing. 
The average housing unit in Ontario consumes more than 32,000 kilowatt hours of energy each year and emits 4,000 kilograms of carbon. So exemplary efforts are needed to ensure that these units are affordable and as energy efficient as possible to minimize operating costs and carbon emissions for years to come. In terms of environmental transportation, Council could consider converting key downtown streets, such as Bank and Elgin, to be accessible only to electric or multi-occupant vehicles. We have high occupancy green lanes on Highway 417, and ESAC suggests this concept could decrease tailpipe emissions in our city core at almost no cost. Thirdly, we strongly urge that our official plan insert measures which will allow Council to require environmental greenness from all stakeholders, especially in the building sector. For years, you have said that the City cannot mandate higher levels of energy efficiency or lower carbon emissions through development agreements and bylaws, so we end up paying $5 billion a year to import carbon energies. This conundrum is due only to the lack of permissive measures in our official plan, and that can be remedied now at zero cost. Last month, Council said a climate impact lens will be applied to all decisions going forward. This climate impact lens should start now with this draft budget. And finally, a budget is a one-year document, but ESAC appeals for bold and actionable strategic priorities for this term of Council that will keep Ottawa from languishing in the bottom ranks of environmental stewardship. There are three terms of council left before the UN warns our environment is in trouble. ESAC thinks it would be very unfortunate if Ottawa sits this term out. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. Eggerson. Any questions for the delegation? Yes, Councillor McKinney. Thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to uh, pick up on your comment about the, um, the new affordable housing and the, 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 um, the link you made with uh, energy and energy efficiency. Uh, I just wanted to point out, I'm sure you know, and, and we can do better certainly, that um, Salas, Ottawa actually just built the first uh, multi-residential passive home in, uh, in the city. Um, and uh, Ottawa Community Housing is going to build another passive uh, um, uh, building on uh, Rochester. So our, our non-profit agencies are actually leading the way. Our, our social housing providers and our supportive housing providers are actually leading the way on energy efficiency and, and uh, passive builds, um, often because they house the very people who need uh, that type of, of savings, but also because they are uh, very good stewards. So I just, I just wanted to point, I know that you probably know that, but I just wanted to make that point. So thank you for bringing it up, I appreciate it. And thank you for being aware of that. Many people are not. Thank you. As mentioned, our next speaker is Emma Coulter, and followed by Rob Burns. Thanks, just press the button in front of you there. Good to go. Thanks. Uh, my name's Emma. Um, I'm also with the Healthy Transportation Coalition. Um, I was originally going to kind of speak to the same things that Aaron said, but since you don't um, necessarily see the relevance of that to this committee, I just, um, I just like it's not, to... It's not about seeing that. I don't want, I don't want you to think, take away that I didn't see the relevance. I'm just saying there's, there's specific mandates for certain committees, and that's all. Okay, well, I just, I'd like to stress the importance of investing in transportation infra infrastructure to get people off the roads, um, which can be done by improving connections in a, um, among communities and reducing fares. Uh, transit and house housing are both huge factors that affect the environment, so it's important not to disregard that. Um, the Beyond 2036 plan um, envisions Ottawa as the most livable city, which um, strives for safety, quality of education, choices in mobility, and access to city amenities. Um, residents describe livability in regards to transportation as affordable, accessible, and convenient. If we want to become the city envisioned in the Beyond 2036 plan, we must focus on improving public transportation in an effort to reduce private car usage, which is one of the leading causes of emissions. Um, the development of affordable housing and proximity to transit stations, along with improved connections to existing neighborhoods, is necessary for reducing emissions in urban sprawl. We should strive 
service that people prefer over their cars. Investing in transportation by improving connections to transit is key for reduced personal vehicle use and allows for the compact urban design sought after in the Beyond 2036 plan. Um, the city of Ottawa's goal to become the most livable city in, by 2036 um, must be deeply considered by the environmental and social impact. Uh, sorry. Um, City Council must deeply consider the environmental and social impact of an affordable, accessible, and equitable transportation system. Uh, by committing to efficient land use and a quality transit system, this goal becomes more feasible. Thank you very much. Any questions for the least? Councilor Minard. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for your, your delegation. Um, we've actually heard delegations at every committee so far around uh, healthy transportation and the uh, cost of our transit system and how that relates to, to everything we do um, in this city. I think you're so right to point out the new t Beyond 2036 plan, uh, which does directly in there say that we need an affordable, accessible uh, transportation system. Um, so to, to you, what does that mean? Does that mean $3.50 fares? Does that mean the highest, some of the highest fares in North America? Um, does that, what does that mean to you? Councilor Mayor, you know that this isn't for this committee. I think you can answer. Uh, well, so Sorry, I, uh, I recently, like I have a car now and I only drive because it's the cheaper option and I, I don't think it's right to have to choose between negatively impacting the environment and taking the bus um, when it's cheaper even to Uber, just to drive, the, it's just too expensive. Thanks. Do you have a question for the delegation on transit? No. Environment? Right. Water and waste management. Were you aware that the, that the document, the draft budget 2019 for the Standing Committee on Environment Protection, Water and Wastewater is actually entitled Better Roads and Transit, Safer Communities, More Housing? Just saying. Did, yeah. Were you? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So I wasn't until now. I looked it up, and there it is, transit. So good on us. We know Thank the you. relevance. I realize that asking specific transit questions and budget questions on transit is somewhat out of order, and we can't do anything about it, but it, it does say transit right there on the document. Much for asking a question that you already knew the answer to. I always ask questions that I know the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> it's the safest way to be a politician. That's right. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Rob Burns. Good morning. Uh, I prepared a, a slide show for this, uh, this morning's presentation uh, and uh, very happy to be here on behalf of uh, Ecology. Um, so we, uh, we're positioning our statements uh, in the context of climate change. I think it's a, it's a theme we're hearing a lot about today. Um, this, is, uh, this is a rough estimate as to where we are and where we can get uh, given the tools at our disposal uh, towards our 2050 target. Uh, and as, uh, as many of you know, our 2050 target is 80% below 2012 level, so a fairly uh, big jump down from where we currently are. Um, we have seen recent emissions reductions due to the coal phase out largely, uh, but we're going to need to do a lot uh, on transportation buildings and especially renewable energy, these three areas uh, as we move forward as well as um, others like agriculture and uh, waste management. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's, that's how we're positioning our company today. Um, in terms of the, the positive aspects of this draft budget, there are a few things that, that we took away that, that were uh, definitely good news. Uh, continued funding for energy evolution and the additional $2 million uh, for uh, what's colloquially known as the BEAM team. So this is the, the energy efficiency group within uh, City Hall uh, working on corporate, uh, corporate emissions. So that's, that's fantastic. That's a good increase. Um, tree canopy, we're seeing uh, more of the same, which is uh, you know 500,000 uh, trees over four years. So these are 
couple steps in the right direction. Uh, we do have a list of questions and concerns, though. First of all, on energy evolution, the question is, is $150,000 enough uh, for basically managing uh, a massive energy transition and uh, piloting the city of Ottawa through one of the largest crises facing humanity today. So the scope of the challenge is quite large. Is $150,000 enough to throw at the problem? Uh, we're skeptical. Uh, last year, we were asking for $1.5 million. City came forward with $500,000. So we're seeing a decrease. Um, we do have uh, questions as to the staffing composition. Um, some of the line items have changed, and so there are actually questions we don't know the answers to. Um, do we know that the plan is, is on track and will be effectively implemented at the scale that is required and of course there are items in phase one uh, 33 um, and if we're really serious about hitting our targets and again I'll back up to that uh, slide slide there we're really going to have to be aggressive in terms of our implementation here uh, we don't really have any other options um, Final question there is, are we in a position budget-wise to ramp up a reporting regimen to an annual basis? Um, questions and concerns on urban forest management plan. We have been assured that the UFMP is on track. Uh, that, is, that is good news to hear. Um, we don't see any funding in 2019, but we've been told that, that's, that's, uh, that current uh, work there is being covered by previous uh, years of budgets. Um, but it, just a reminder again. Uh, to the committee that you know we have 13 uh, major items in the first management period and uh, this is the the first of the next well basically we have two years left after this year to implement a number of, of serious uh, serious uh, items on the uh, urban forest management plan um, things that we are concerned about uh, more broadly are uh, purchase of natural areas. We know that the city typically devotes about $800,000 to urban and rural uh, uh, areas, and we cannot identify this line item, uh, nor can we identify one for Green Fleet, which we saw $500,000 uh, devoted to last year. Again, it might be the case that these are under other line items. Uh, I know that the changes year over year, but these are questions that we have given the document before us. Uh, and there are a few things missing. Um, if we wanted to be ambitious, where are the resources for electric vehicle infrastructure investments, uh, resources for expansion of green infrastructure, that is to say the living and built systems designed to slow down, soak up, and filter rainwater where it falls, help us adapt to a changing climate. And where is the uh, climate resilience plan? This is something that has been a long promised plan. Uh, we are looking forward to seeing that in future future uh, years uh, as we do not see that in the uh, year. There are opportunities, uh, one of which was already mentioned, if there is already mo movement in the direction of social housing, which we're very happy to hear, uh, can we make sure that those investments are earmarked for best-in-class energy efficiency standards? Similarly with road maintenance, we know that a lot of the budget is going towards road maintenance and repair, and to a certain extent expansion. Uh, can we consider green infrastructure and complete streets as part of those processes and make sure that they're uh, a mandatory piece? So in conclusion, uh, our sense is that the, the draft budget that we see here right now uh, as it stands is inadequate to the scope and scale of the climate crisis. Um, the status of energy evolution remains uh, somewhat dubious. Um, and then, and too many items are missing. And finally, just again, uh, a broader view as to where we are relative to where we need to be. We know that the UN tells us we have now 11 years to uh, really adapt uh, and, and, and mitigate climate change. Uh, that's three terms of council, and we're partway through uh, the first one. So we're urging uh, this uh, committee to be very ambitious in terms of its uh, funding allocations for climate change related investments. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Would you be able to, I don't know if you uh, shared this with us prior, but would you be able to share it with me at least? Uh, Absolutely. You obviously have some questions in there that we probably won't get answers to today, but I can yeah. follow up and correspond directly with you. Be happy to. Um, Councillor Edgar? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, um, I took one of the questions out of, out of my head, so to speak. I was going to ask Rob to share as well, so that's great. Uh, one of the things I, I just wanted to point out, Rob, though, and, and with the full of, of the chair, I'll be introducing a motion this morning that recommends that any hydro surplus in this terminal council, the, the full amount, goes towards um, uh, energy and, and uh, environmental projects within the city. So I'm hoping that will will pass. And and again, uh, full support of the chair. So that may answer some of the the questions that you've raised or some of the concerns. But again, hopefully that will pass here this morning and then go into pass the council. All right, thank you very much, Councillor Regler. Councillor Brockinson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Burns, for your presentation. Um, 
I just very briefly, there are two new social housing um, developments in my way that opened recently. Both were very energy efficient. They actually spent more than what they had to to realize that. And in Carlington last week, we were told that um, in the 42 unit low rise apartment building, the heating costs for the resident will be $100 a year. So, um, and that's because of the smart investments in the, that building homes that were built on uplands that opened earlier as well. Very, very good cost savings. So it's good to see that. Um, just on, I mean, I, I fully embrace your sentiment about we're sitting on a ticking time bomb and um, no one's panicking. I mean, it's really scary. And when we have $150,000 invested in energy evolution, it's, it's insulting, really. So um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but has Ecology Ottawa met with the mayor? to talk about more funding specifically to address more initiatives under this uh, umbrella? And if so, what has the outcome of that conversation been? Thank you. Um, we have not met with the mayor. Uh, last year, we were part of a group uh, in association with a group called CAFES, which is Community Associations for Environmental Sustainability. Uh, we met with a number of councillors and uh, sought a meeting with the mayor, uh, were directed to the chair of the Environment Committee at that time uh, to have a meeting with the chair as opposed to the mayor. Um, we have not yet, for this year's budget, requested a meeting with the mayor, but we will do so. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Oh, seeing none, thank, thank you very you. much. Well, um, our next speaker, our last speaker, is Angela Keller Herzog. So, uh, um, it's uh, nice to uh, see you, especially the new members of council who have uh, joined this committee. And um, it's also very nice to see other councillors taking an interest in environment who are not um, formally members of the uh, committee. My presentation will be uh, regarding the draft budget um, with a climate lens. My name is Angela keller Herzog, and I'm here speaking um, for CAFES, the Community Associations for Environmental Sustainability, which is a group of over 50 community associations. Uh, now, how do I make this go forward? Uh, there we are. All right. Um, so the big question is whether we are on track. Um, and obviously, the budget offers a particular lens um, to that question. Um, uh, in terms of setting the context, I think we're all aware of the um, expert reports which are raising the alarm. As Greta Thunberg, um, a 15-year-old activist, puts it, the house is on fire. Um, in Ottawa, we have seen more instances of more extreme weather, um, including an almost weekly freeze-thaw cycle, which is, um, I think, costing us budgetarily. Um, we've seen that Vancouver, Halifax, and um, I think 248 Quebec municipalities have declared a climate change emergency. Um, increasingly, the financial sector is asking for financial disclosures with regard to risk and liabilities. Um, insurance premiums, and I suspect for the city of Ottawa too, are rising significantly, not just 3%, but more like, you know, 40. Um, federal government, Infrastructure Canada, has developed a climate lens project tool, um, which measures um, climate impact, both in terms of emissions as well as risk. Um, and utilities around North America are investing in increasing resilience. Um, so I guess Councillor Eglai has uh, left, but an interesting question would be what Hydro Ottawa is doing with regard to that and whether there will be a surplus after they invest in upgrades for resiliency. So my next two slides um, show um, this one, the overall 
um, conclusions that we get in looking at the draft budget. We see that the city does not recognize that there is a climate emergency. So there's no sense of urgency um, and that climate deliberations can't wait to say the official plan post 2036. So we find that reaction too slow. Secondly, we're seeing that the city is not using the tools and powers at its disposal to invest in climate solutions. Um, for example, establishing municipal green building standards, helping residents finance home energy retrofits, greening the OC transfer fleet, etc. Some of the issues that Bill Everton and Rob Barnes were raising. And thirdly, we see that the city is not investing in preparedness, and in resiliency. Um, I'd like to raise three specific um, points because sometimes action can be commanded at the specific level and that's really where the devil is. So first of all, a very positive acknowledgement. Um, we very much welcome that the budget of the Building Engineering and Energy Management Unit has been increased from one to three million. Um, I think that in a longer time perspective, this will save there's money, so that's a good one. Second of all, we would like to know whether there are sufficient resources in draft budget 2019 to enable annual greenhouse gas emissions reporting for Ottawa, both corporate and community. In our view, the city, and I guess this committee, is not able to manage emissions if we don't measure them. Um, and previously we've been told that there's resource constraint issues, why we're not able to get annual reports. The third point I'd like to raise, and I didn't actually know Rob was going to so specifically address that too, we would like to know whether the draft budget 2019 contains sufficient resources to continue to deliver on the 33 action items of energy evolution phase one. Um, I went through the 2017 document that was um, provided to this committee, and there was a third column where items required additional budget. Um, so some of the items, and I won't go through all of it obviously, but the expansion of rebates for air source heat bumps, uh, building an 11 megawatt solar park at Trail Road Waste Facility. So it's, it's kind of obvious that the scale of resources is, is a whole different dimension from the 150,000 that we're seeing in this budget. Um, so in view of your new mandate, um, we would look to this committee for leadership, monitoring, accountability, and appropriate budgetary resource allocations, as well as taking a look at risk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Councillor Menard? Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, one of the things that you mentioned was around the energy evolution um, 33 action items. In the first go around, we didn't actually uh, put any funding beside those those items specifically. Uh, so, how much would it cost to have a um, you know a, store, a solar installation at a facility, that sort of thing? In in the next phase, would you recommend that we actually put dollar figures beside action items so that we can appropriately budget for these things in the future? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, if if you do have, I, I think that it's it's quite a good satisfying format what we're seeing with both the urban forest management plan and the energy evolution work is strategic work and then also the identification of quick actions so that we're not just dragging it out for like yet another term of council and then will they actually pick up action items so i think that approach is good but not costing the budget items that that is where, where that's highly problematic. This is a supplemental, if I may, uh, Mr. Chair. I probably, I probably should have asked Mr. Barnes this, but um, you know, one of the things in the budget shows that we have a carry forward of money that wasn't spent in the first in the last year on energy evolution. Um, so I think it's about two hundred eighty-nine thousand dollars that will be carried forward as a, as a spend uh, on energy evolution this year. I'm going to confirm that with staff uh, in the discussion portion. Uh, but it, it was clearly looked like we, we underspent, we actually didn't spend the full amount that we budgeted for last year. So even though we've gone down, um, we had underspent uh, in that first year. So uh, I guess the question to you would be, you know, you had asked for $1.5 million previously. Is that is that the number you're looking for now? Or is there a figure in your mind that, that would help to um, enhance our, our uh, you know, targets that we've set? 
Okay, um, just to clarify, the 1.5 million ask was from Ecology Ottawa, not cafes. Um, I, I think that it's good to have sort of a dimension um, of resources required. So are we talking about a billion or a million or a hundred thousand? Like, I think that is useful. But I think a more um, project management and sort of traction oriented approach would be to monitor the action commitments cost them and then identify sources of funding. So for example, if there's a particular strategy and action plan that has a project that is estimated to cost $5 million, of which half of it is expected to come from the province of Ontario's Green On, then a decision should be made whether the city will provide that funding when Green On is or whether the whole project will be dropped. And right now, I'm not seeing that kind of a systematic follow-up process. I don't think that on the agenda of this committee will be annual updates on energy evolution phase one action project, which means as we transition from one environment committee to the next environment committee, things just kind of drop and fall between the cracks. And then it, it, it's up to citizens that have a special interest to kind of revive and wake up the projects again. So this is not really an efficient um, approach. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Brockington, do you have a question to you? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, just one quick question. Thank you for your presentation, as always. Um, what would the net positive impact be if Ottawa were to declare a climate change emergency. As you know, I'm frustrated with uh, the progress of this committee and um, I'm tired of talking. So what do you see the advantages are of this committee, of the city, making that declaration? Because a declaration doesn't come with a set of actions. So you're advocating for it. Help me understand the benefits. Okay, I, I think um, obviously, some of the um, doors that might open with the declaration of an emergency would depend on the creativeness and, and the level of leadership. Um, but I think that just at this committee meeting, we've been seeing that there are important horizontal and cross-sectional issues between environment, emissions, transportation. So if an emergency was declared and there was a higher level of urgency, then maybe we would also be able to address um, more clearly the, the key issues across committees. So if the Environment Committee, for example, in um, like the end of the document on page 47 of this draft budget for this standing committee, there's 500,000 um, of unspent resources for Green Fleet. Um, so if, if suddenly there was an understanding that we urgently needed to act, um, I'm pretty sure that staff and all of you would start to find resources here and there and start saying, okay, we need to do stuff. Um, I mean, maybe there could be a mayoral task force. Um, maybe there could be other mechanisms to um, respond to an emergency status. Um, that would be up to your leadership. <coughs> Um, I, I guess just one small follow-up. Um, I think that if there was an emergency, then clearly um, all councillors, and especially this committee, would also be asking for better and more frequent reporting and information. Um, one of the points that my group, the community associations, has come to this committee repeatedly is that we need data, we need emissions tracking, we need reporting, and one of the questions in my presentation that I think Councillor Brockington, you have also asked, is whether there are sufficient resources for annual reporting. And I think that the resources required are in the neighborhood of forty to fifty thousand dollars, which is trivial, you might say. But again, are we going to get a presentation from staff two months down the road saying, "Oh, we don't have resources to do annual reporting"? Right? All right. Thank you. Oops, for your dogs. Any more? Questions for the delegation? Seeing none. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I do want to get uh, to um, 
I have a motion to move on uh, stormwater rates, but I'll do that uh, when we go through the the approval of the budget, uh, just because I have to rescind the chair to move the motion. Um, but we do have a motion. I'll ask Councillor Eglai to move your motion now on the hydro dividend. So I'll just, uh, I'll read out the whole thing, if you will, Mr. Chair. So whereas phase one of the Energy Evolution Ottawa's Community Energy Transition Strategy was approved by Council December 13, 2017, it framed the beginning of a strategy for Ottawa and approved a three-year action plan designed to manage energy consumption, promote the use of renewable energy, and advance local economic development opportunities in Ottawa. And whereas on December 13, 2017, Council approved by way of motion that City Council approved that any surplus in the hydro dividend received in 2018 will be reallocated such that two-thirds of the amount be directed towards the road resurfacing program and that one-third be directed towards energy efficiency programs within the city with specific projects to be recommended by the Environment and Climate Protection Committee and Council once a specific dollar amount, if any, is known. Whereas in June 2018, Council approved the Energy Evolution Ottawa's Community Energy Transition uh, strategy phase two update, which included staff's recommendation for eight energy initiatives that would be funded using the 2018 dividend surplus amount of $633,000 and whereas the initial support of the strategy's objective to reduce energy consumption and GHG emissions transition to renewable energy uh, sources rather and promote Ottawa as a center for innovation and whereas it, ex it is expected there will be further hydro Ottawa surplus dividends going forward for the 2018-2022 term of council therefore be it resolved that the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection Water and Waste Management recommend the council prove that any surplus in the hydro Ottawa dividend received in the 2018-2022 term of council that is the amount that, that exceeds the projected amount in the long-range financial plan be to be directed towards energy efficiency, conservation, or renewable energy programs within Ottawa with specific pro projects to be recommended by staff and approved by the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management and Council once the specific dollar amount, if any, is known. All right, thank you. So we'll vote on that when we go through the, the budget. Essentially, the idea is that we did this in for the 2018 budgets uh, it was it was flipped around and a third went to energy projects uh, two-thirds went to uh, roads projects with the way that the 2019 budget is drafted and is well projecting for the rest of the term of council we are addressing the road issues uh, through the appropriate budget uh, for that uh, so i think it makes sense for anything that comes from energy surplus to go back into energy uh, through this committee um, so, good questions to staff. I know Councillor Hubley, you had some questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Back to the the budget presentation that you, uh, the Deputy Treasurer gave. The um, amount, uh, and I think the Chair touched on some of this, but the amount uh, that we're using for reserves per, uh, versus revenue to, to get through this budget seemed quite high, but uh, you mentioned there's an offset of what's going into the reserves. Typically, we have uh, actuaries that tell us how much the reserves should be. Where are we uh, with these reserves for uh, this committee? So um, the balance in uh, the water reserves is projected to be at 95 million. Uh, wastewater, 63 million, and stormwater would be a negative 23 million. We're catching up on that one. Um, and uh, what we're actually hoping to do as part of the disposition report is to rebalance those a little bit. But in total, um, that's about 120 million in reserves. Now there's money that comes in every year as part of the operating budget, 160 million is a contribution to those reserves. And then it goes out back out to capital projects around the similar. But you didn't tell me whether that's uh, what the actuaries tell you we should have or not. Are we above or below where we're supposed to be? Uh, we're actually in fairly good position in, in the right side. On the right side? Yeah. But not on the... And so this is one where it wasn't based on actuarial estimation. This was one was based on 10-year um, trends in, in terms of overall surpluses and deficits, and it would cover um, most deficits in, 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 in the worst years worst is basically years. what we're okay. trying to get to. So then my uh, next question is uh, on page 10 of the budget. Um, uh, resiliency and natural systems policy. Uh, it shows transfer grants and financial charges of uh, 362,000. 
Which is which is that? Because uh, those are not uh, what I would think would be like-minded uh, uh, charges here. Are they transfers, grants, or or financial charges? Combination thereof, and what would that rate be if that's the case? I'd have to look into the details for that one. Typically, this line item is for the contribution to capital, and if there's any service charges, likely it would be grants, but I, I can look into it and get more detail for you. Is it possible to get a list of those grants? Not, yeah, not today. I would, I yeah, I would have to get, get those, those, those details. If it is that, I'm, I can't con confirm okay. that. Mr. Chair, if I may add, that was the 362 was the 2017 actual number. The budget for this year is 50, 50 uh, as opposed to 362, so it's a much lower number. And that's what caught my eye as the big difference here. What did we do last year that drove that up to 362? So I'd just like to see a, a breakout of that if I could, because otherwise we may not be budgeting at the right number, or did we, or, you know, I, I just want to see what we did before I start guessing on it. Mr. Chair, I think we have confidence in this, but we'll get the council before council and the final adoption. We do believe the number's right, but we'll get you the history of that number, why it was higher. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Hubley. Councilor Aguilar? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking at the, uh, the main budget report um, on page 13. Uh, there's a, uh, it talks about the stormwater fees and talks about the phase in approach. And um, so when it says the stormwater fee will continue to be phased in for non-connected properties in 2019, they'll be at 75% of the full. For the average rural single family household, and then it, it gives the breakdown. That's the only example that's provided, however. I just want it to confirm for the record um, for the non-connected, non-rural areas, such as Pine Glen, Maryville Gardens, Orchard Estates, uh, in, in uh, Councillor Hart, for example, that even though they're not referenced specifically, that they are still fit from the phased-in approach. That is correct. They're going to be at 75%. Thank you for that clarification. Um, uh, one of the uh, one of the delegations, I believe, was, they spoke about the costing piece for energy evolution. How um, the projects are listed, but the costing is not necessarily there. I'm wondering if you can speak to why that's the case, and if if you see any. Uh, I guess any benefit, and if there is a benefit, how we would go ahead and make sure that, that the costing is listed uh, for review by both the committee council and also by the public. So, Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, in the phase two report, which we're bringing later this year, we will revisit and report on the status of all the phase one projects. We'll add costing in. I think it's an excellent uh, suggestion from the delegation, which we support, and we will provide costing for the phase two related projects, as well as a series of options for council to understand what your spending trajectory might be under the next number of years. But it is our intention to report on the status at that time and also bring this all together as one report. It'd be ideal going forward that we're just dealing with one report rather than a phase one, phase two. We're just going to wrap it all together. And, and sorry, you may have said it, but, but just to clarify, when is that report coming to us this year? in the fourth quarter of this year. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Thanks, and the breakdown of the fees and the 75% phase, it's on page 21 of the rate budget. They do break it down, they have the, the residential non-connected, so urban single, rural single, rural tenants, and it's all there in the, the specific. I, I, I do appreciate that, it just sometimes the general public doesn't have the the expertise to go through the line by line. Screenshot it and just send it to and, everyone. And they read the, they read the report though, and I just wanted it Confirmed. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor McKinney. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is on the uh, reporting for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I just uh, want to know from staff um, what is the, the budget for annual reporting on, uh, on our emissions? And where is that uh, pointed in the, if you can point me that, to that in our uh, 2019 draft budget? So, Mr. Chair, for the reporting on annual reporting on corporate emissions, we are we have absorbed that within the cost of the department, and we'll be reporting from now on on an annual basis on the corporate emissions. We do not have a 2019 proposal for community emissions, and the cost of that would be approximately 50 to 55, 60 thousand dollars, depending on what the procurement ultimately ends up. But that's the approximate 
that is not in the budget at this stage because we did not have the resources to, for that. So that is the, the one obviously that I'm looking for is on uh, community emissions. Um, so that would lead me to believe then that we're not uh, going to get a report for 2019 um, on our, the reduction on community emissions. Is that, uh, is that correct? That is correct. It, it, we, the intention was we had been doing it on a four-year frequency. We're investigating and doing it on a redu reduced frequency. And when we report on the air quality and climate change master plan in a couple of months, and I believe that's quarter two, we will give you the costs for additional frequency reporting in that and get your direction at that time. So what is the fifty-five to 60000 Is that the, cost, uh, the, the annual cost to... Uh, to uh, providing um, a community emissions reporting to uh, this committee? That's correct. We don't, we don't have the internal resources to do that, so we would re be required to use a consultant and w estimating from the t what we paid for last time with likely inflation on that price, that's what the number co uh, is there for. And we will be seeing this direction on that in the quarter two report. In Q2 2019, in, in Q2 2019, Mr. Chair, we will be re doing the update on the air quality and climate change master plan and report on that. And in that report, we will ask committee for direction on future years in terms of that reporting. And by asking for direction, do you anticipate that you'll be asking for the revenue required to do annual reporting? Mr. Chair, if committee directs us to do it on an annual basis, we will identify the cost of it and it will have to be built into future budgets. Well, it would seem to me then that now would be a good time to do that. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll work on that direction uh, for this uh, for this meeting because uh, there's no doubt that the one th you know the one thing that we can move on it just seems like such a, a low cost item for such a high return for us to understand how we're doing on reducing um, our GHG um, emissions and you know. I think level is uh, is uh, so important so I will work on that direction uh, to uh, ask for uh, for you to come back with that and um, I wonder also um, where you know is the the staffing for all of our uh, climate files where how, where are we approving that today so, Mr. Chair, we've actually managed to improve our staffing levels with using existing resources of the department without asking you for more additional resources. We've reallocated from other areas of the department. So we did take uh, one position, created one new senior project manager position, which Ms. Flowers is here sitting next to me helping me today in this. We've also uh, managed to redeploy a new position that is not yet filled for a project manager level in the climate change file. And that, uh, because that does not require additional resources, it does not show up as an additional ask to this committee. Okay. So there, there is, um, what, uh, because the, the climate file is also uh, across departments, um, and we've heard today from uh, some folks who have come to the table that, uh, that, that that is a concern, that we're a bit siloed, or we can be a bit siloed in how we look at things. Um, what, is the, what is the terms of reference or the, the framework, the governance framework for uh, those staffing um, positions and what we're doing and the work we're doing across uh, departments? So Mr. Chair, the answer I gave you relates just to planning infrastructure and economic development and it's part of a team that's focused on uh, climate change uh, management and the, and the policy setting and the resiliency work which we, the resiliency plan is proceeding this year. We actually will be issuing an RFP within days for the first phase of that project so it is actually starting. The issue on interdepartmental I, I can be in a call on a monthly basis with department heads or, or at least the director levels from the multiple departments, public works, or RCFS, corporate services, who all have a different role in, in this to do coordination between the various departments. And uh, the treasurer is also looking at establishing a, a unit looking to uh, monitor our energy consumption spending format of energy as well. And that's what and we'll be reporting later on that. So you're in discussion for, I'll, uh, I'll use an example with fleet and transit around uh, moving away from um, uh, buses that, you know, the, towards um, um, uh, electric buses. 
the buses that use, uh, you know, less, no fossil fuel, is that, uh, how, how does that work? I mean, uh, we're not seeing the, the movement in our transit fleet towards uh, electric yet, so how, how does that work within the interdepartmental uh, governance around the climate files? So, Mr. Chair, the council just picked a very specific example that I'm not in the best position to answer because there's no one from Transportation Services here to assist on this. Uh, in other areas, uh, we certainly do a great deal of coordination, so there's a lot of work between Public Works and us, the BEAM group, and our operations as well as corporate services. Uh, the, the other issue, Councillor, I'm afraid I just can't don't have the resources, but we'll get you additional information on that. Okay, perhaps we can ask that also at uh, transit and transportation as well. So I'll uh, just give a heads up that uh, I want to know how uh, we are coordinating our climate files and, and how we're looking at reductions in GHGs and how that relates to what we're doing on transit, what we're doing in transportation. Um, you know, the example I used very specific to uh, new buses, um, you know, when we report back, what, what does it mean not to, not to move more aggressively towards um, uh, an electric fleet of buses? What does that do to... Um, the results for, for our GHG uh, emissions. So um, we've, got, uh, we've got a few more meetings and uh, we can ask those questions again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Brockington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you, um, staff, tell me um, how estimated for the sale of recyclable material given the challenges on the global market for what we sell? What is it looking like in 2019 compared to more recent years? Uh, Chair, I'll ask uh, Marilyn Journeau to come up and, and answer, but if I can provi provide just a little bit of context. Ottawa is in very, very good uh, position in terms of marketing our material. Everything's going to market, and that is primarily due to the clean streams that we are collecting. Uh, through the Chair, yes, we have... Uh as Kevin Marley uh, suggested, we have been very successful in marketing all of our materials from our blue and black box programs. Um, in the previous two years, we had extremely high, higher than estimated um, sale of the recyclables. Uh, one year was two million over the estimate and the other year was three million. Last year, we were short by just under 200,000 or just about $200,000. So we were pretty well were on target. Um, the markets appear to have stabilized, and we are expecting uh, status quo this year, so basically the same revenues as we received last year. Um, but we are moving all of our material, and, uh, and hopefully the markets will continue to rebound. It's good to hear. Thank you for that. Um, green bin use. We talked about in the last term of council the need for an education campaign to move that 44% um, household use much higher as well as multi-unit uh, residences. What is the plan for an education campaign? This year, as uh, I'm sure you're all aware, we're planning on adding plastic bags and dog feces to the Green Bin program. Uh, we anticipate that this will drive the, the participation in the program currently about of the households use the green bin and a quarter of the apartment buildings have access to a green bin program. We are trying to drive up the participation by making it more convenient and dealing with the ick factor. Um, there is an additional $250,000 in the communications budget to roll out the plastics and green bin and dog feces in the green bin program. <clears throat> I'm specifically looking to see promotion and a campaign with respect to green bin use up and above what we've already done thus far. Because what we've done thus far has yielded a 40% um, success rate, if we can call that a success rate. So, new money, I'd like to know what the net plan will be specifically for green bin, and if there's no specific plan identified yet, and if more resources are needed, if you could identify that before we go to council, because that's something I think we need to be looking at in 2019 and, and beyond. So either I leave that with you and we can talk offline, but I do think we've heard loud and clear that our numbers are poor, we can do better, and we need to see uh, an increased plan in that regard. Chair, if I can add, our, uh, 
The money that uh, Ms. Journeau talked about uh, was actually savings in the green bin program because the putter pay was reduced upon signing of the contract. So there was uh, savings uh, for corporate or for communications plan. Our corporate uh, communications partners have gone out and done a focus group that'll uh, on participation in the green bin. That will be the foundation of the rollout of the communication plan and you'll hear about the implementation implementation plan uh, including communication uh, probably two to th two to three two and a half months prior to the launch of the new program which is anticipated for July this year okay thank you um, recycling and parks it's listed uh, in some of the introductory pages that um, this is now a focus I just wanted some clarification because it's my understanding we had a pilot project about recycling in parks. Is it the intention to make this permanent? Uh, last year we uh, piloted uh, 50 parks with recycling in those parks um, and we found fairly good evidence that we could get uh, clean waste stream good. or clean recyclables out of that park um, as long as the bins were co-located with garbage cans. Right. Uh, this year we've committed to council to pilot green bins in parks so we'll be uh, targeting 10 parks not necessarily dog parks but we'll uh, look at linear parks and multi-use parks as well um, and we will uh, in will again try to play with some parks we'll have recycling co-located uh, and others with garbage we want to understand what the contamination levels are in the three different streams so we're bring out that pilot this summer uh, the results of the two pilots will then be combined and we will be coming back to committee next year likely with some recommendations on how we could possibly proceed. So will the 50 parks that had recycling in them in 2018 continue in 2019? Not based on the current fund. Only, so we're going to have three streams. Every time you pick up a different stream, obviously the cost goes up. So with the same allocation that we used last year we're going to try and maximize so it may be more than 10 parks likely but it won't be the 50. Can you get me a quote before council? Uh, well it's basically using existing staff and equipment that we purchased last year okay. uh, with the addition of some new bins. I'll follow up. Um, one of the reasons why we have a uh, water rate much higher than the rate of inflation and we have uh, set out a plan for many years as we've been told that our infrastructure is in critical condition and we had to budget accordingly because we had to address it in the now. Um, can you confirm for me that all water main projects that are in critical condition are either in the design phase in 2019 or construction phase? Are there any water mains in critical condition not being addressed in 2019? Chair, sure, when we talk about criticality, we're really talking about our large uh, mains that service large pop, uh, segments of the population, and we do have um, an inspection program specifically to those mains, so we do have good information. I think what you're referring to are basically some of the smaller mains where uh, more distribution, where there's been higher frequency of we monitor very closely and we start to program them for renewal when basically the it is justified to move it to that level of investment um, on these small mains uh, we can appreciate basically when there's a water main break, it's about ten thousand dollars to to repair it um, every meter to replace is about three thousand so there is a significant investment to be made to replace a main and often we will be looking at coordination opportunities so before we move uh, those areas to actual renewal we want to make sure that the investment is warranted and I appreciate that uh, my concern being a member of this committee and council is that we mitigate the public as much as possible I know that's a main concern for staff as well but um, when we're defending the rate increases within our communities at least I tell them is we're trying to address critical infrastructure needs that is the a vast majority of the increase of the rate in additional pressures. So you didn't say yes and you didn't say no. You talked about diameters of pipes, but are there still infrastructure needs out there that are in critical condition that we just can't get to because of resource issues? Sure, if there are critical needs, those needs are being addressed. 
and you're correct, those are what's been driving, uh, in part, uh, some of the rate increases, but those rate increases are also uh, to address basically what are very capital intensive services and there are significant investments that are just required to base, basically sustain those assets in state of good condition. During the presentation, we, we identified kind of a snapshot of the scale of the type of assets that we're dealing with. There's significant investments being made at the treatment plants, at the pumping stations, and also among the pipe network. So it's not just about the pipes, it's really part of the, bro uh, the broader system. Mr. Chair, I have a few more questions. Can I keep going? Um, I'm not choosing to take this invasive species, emerald ash borer, and um, oh, it's just lost my mind. The, the no, the ticks, but invasive species, the, the plant that causes the acidic burn. What's that? Parsnip. Parsnip. Thank you. Um, can staff just talk about, first of all, invasive, uh, the emerald ash borer? We have the forestry uh, line for planting. I'm sure that um, some of the tornado relief is part of. Uh, budget increase. Where are we with respect to emerald ash borer and removing of trees, replanting those trees? Through the chair. Um, so the operational requirements for the emerald ash borer have not yet come to an end. Uh, we continue with, uh, we have ash injection programs. Uh, we still have woodlot removals, ash trees along rural roads, and the remaining and street uh, park removals. So there is still some work that's continuing uh, with the Emerald Ash Borer. We did hit a peak in 2015 uh, where our efforts were really focused around uh, treating the Emerald Ash Borer and the trees that were affected. Um, since that time, obviously, uh, preventive maintenance programs uh, were put uh, to the back burner. We're now ramping up our preventive maintenance programs again, which include tree pruning. We also, um, as the shift moves away from the emerald ash borer, um, the commitment of the half million trees uh, through this term of council, we will bring some of those funding towards the planting of those trees. And eventually, uh, we will be focusing funding to some of the programs that will be developed through the Urban Forest Management Plan. Um, has any consideration been given to assisting uh, private homeowners or landlords um, with trees on their private property, not on the city right of way, but if they lost, I'm specifically talking about tornado relief, if they lost trees on their property, we have considered stump grinding. This seems like an exceptional uh, circumstance. Will your budget cover any of this? And how are we, and if not, how will we help link homeowners or landlords to groups that provide trees that can help cover some of the costs? Through the chair. Through city funding, we haven't yet considered any programming for uh, private residences because we are working closely with other organizations, particularly Tree Canada. They launched uh, an operation relief uh, program uh, I think it was October or November of last year. It's still ongoing. It's a uh, sponsorship program where they'll be able to assist private homeowners uh, with replanting efforts on their lots uh, for both Ottawa and Gatineau area. That program, I believe, is going to be uh, closing at the end of February, so we should have more information on the funding that will be available. The other piece is we are working with uh, other private organizations who have said that they want to uh, and we're trying to find out how we can incorporate them into assisting private residences, whether it's through Tree Canada or programs that they'll offer in terms of replanting. Excellent, thank you. My last chair, uh, my last question, Mr. Chair, is regarding the 150,000 that's being uh, budgeted for energy evolution. Um, can I just get an understanding, how did that specific number come about, given the number of initiatives that could be uh, tackled? Mr. Chair, the Finance Department, we looked at the amount of cash flow we would require to complete the energy evolution project and bring the report to Council at the end of this year. Q4. This is the amount of money we require to get to that report. That report, as I indicated, will indicate 
suggested capital investments for the future. This is just related to that number. The money that we were not, uh, we did not need, we was redeployed to the BEAM program because we felt important that it stay within the climate change file. So that's where some of the additional resources we previously would have had have gone over to support the increase in that spending area. And Mr. Chair, are, are there not other initiatives though that could be tackled instead of waiting basically another year? Is there other initiatives that staff could identify with a cost that we can consider before we come to council? Uh, Mr. Chair, they, it's, it's simply an issue of we're trying to meet this, the tax target set by us by council. Uh, all departments work collaboratively. There is spend, spending on climate change related issues that don't show up in the, under the energy evolution label when we think about the improvements at Rogue, when we think about building in, investments in individual buildings that appear in the capital project that might be, for example, under the and Protective Services Committee budget. It's just that it doesn't get rolled up that way in one budget. So it's not that money is not being spent. It is on a capital investment basis, but not, a, but albeit not towards those action items that uh, was, were shown on earlier, those will require substantially larger amounts of money that it was not possible to finance this year. Mr. Chair, if I can just add to that, we, we apply a climate change lens to everything we do uh, when we do renewal. So for instance, quite a bit of work going on in our pump stations. All the lights are switched out at the same time for LED lights. So that's the kind of thing that we do on an ongoing basis and Mr. Willis is quite, quite correct. Uh, it does get eventually rolled up to the overall uh, plan, but it's not something you would see in a budget as a day-to-day -day item. And Mr. P Chair, with a bit of patience, uh, additional point is with the additional money that Council directed to be put forward for infrastructure renewal, uh, in the initial years of the and this program is a heavy emphasis on road, uh, road surface renewals through the road resurfacing program. We do contemplate in, the, in subsequent years more of that money going to building inventory and that will have a substantial climate change effect when it goes into that area. Thank you, Councillor Brockington. Just to, just to touch on the, some of the education, I mean, with the Green Bay, I think what's important is that we have an opportunity to educate on a new change in that program. Educating on the existence program after it's been around for 10 years, I'm not sure is that effective. I mean, the individual that brought, that demanded I go pick up his green bin in 2012 when we switched to biweekly garbage collection because he refused to use it, he doesn't need education. He doesn't give, you know, well, you know what I'm going to say, about the green bin program. And that, a lot of that is because they don't want to use it the way we ask them to use it. They don't want to use it with a, with, with a paper bag. They don't want to create origami newspaper in their kitchen um, in order to use it. Um, but we're trying to make it easier. The other part is the multi res aspect. And I know Marilyn mentioned that we're in 25% of apartment buildings, but or they have access to it, but we need to do better on that. And education, I don't think, is the, really the key to that. It's availability, and how can we do that? And I think we have a stakeholders group that works on uh, multi-res, I'm hoping to get involved in that and see how we can advance that further. Um, when we started this in the first place in 2008, we set a target that we couldn't reach because we didn't offer the program to enough people to reach the target. We, we, we failed by design. Uh, we have to address that going forward. We can't keep on just hoping that we throw money at education and hope it works. Uh, Councilor Minert. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, on page 28 of the tax supported budget, there's a line item there for uh, $625,000. It's the largest one, I think, for maintaining services. $625,000 slated to go to Orca World or Renui as a result of the plastic bags uh, in the green bin. Can you uh, explain that a little more clearly so folks understand what that is? So Chair, it's, uh, first of all, I think it's important to remember that uh, this was the result of an arbitration settlement with, uh, with Renewi. Um, part of the settlement was the uh, put or pay was reduced from 80,000 tons down to 75,000 tons, and we were implementing plaster bags in the program. Uh, Renewi, for their part, agreed to lower the tipping fee that was in the, current, in the uh, original contract of some 50 odd, uh, 150 odd dollars down to 100 dollars uh, to include dog waste and plastic bags in the green bin. They're also, uh, for their part, uh, offered to uh, not just do, uh, so the, the increase in tipping fee does include uh, the of some of the processing that's necessary at the plant, 
but uh, Renew is also putting in their own money to up, up uh, to do some life cycle work and some uh, uh, additional works at the plant as well. The 625 is just the effect of the new tipping fee for plastics and dog waste for half year effect. So when we implement in July till the end of the year. Okay, thanks for that. And yeah, I'm aware that uh, Order World is increasing or new is increasing their uh, the amount of money that they're um, spending on their own side uh, to sort and uh, to add some more infrastructure there. Um, they're spending quite a bit on that. Not all, obviously, not related to not all related to the plastic bags. So we're sp the 625,000 world and the plastic bags. What are, what are we spending on education? I, I I didn't get a clear answer. Was it 250,000 that we said? Saving, and that's what we're going to be spending on the education for for uh, diversion. What is the actual amount we're spending on uh, education for, for diversion? Chair, unfortunately, I don't have the actual uh, um, funds in front of me, and, and unfortunately, I don't think anybody's here from corporate comms. But my recollection is uh, we were we were earmarking the savings, as I said, from last year of about three hundred thousand dollars for focus groups and preparation of uh, materials. And then we do have an ongoing uh, communications budget of around $250,000 that we'll be putting to the startup of the, of the program. Okay, thanks for that. And I mean, I, I'm going to be tabling a motion or giving notice of motion, I guess, here today to hold off on putting plastic bags in the green bin uh, until we have some studies that we've been commissioned to do, uh, which will come at the end of this meeting. And so I'll that, or I give notification for that today. Um, one of the other things I wanted to touch on was energy evolution. In, in the budget, it's it's down to $150,000, but uh, on page 34, there's also a $289,000 item on spend on the spending plan. Can you just confirm with me that it's it's $150,000 plus the $289,000 that that will be spent, and will that be spent uh, this year? That's that's again page 34 of the tax-supported budget. So Mr. Chair, I'm going to have to ask the councillor's indulgence. We'll get you that answer shortly. I can't determine from the information I have in front of me if the total amount is 289 because we have carryover of unspent funds from 2018 or whether this is a top. I know the answer is we needed 150 additional to get to the end of the energy evolution report and, and that's what it does. This 289 also includes the components for the uh, resiliency plan RFP that I mentioned, that portion as well as some other smaller projects as well. So they, I believe our total spend that we have is 289, but I believe it's because we have a last year. Okay, um, Okay, that's very helpful. Thanks for that. Related related to, to energy evolution is a, is a major item I wanted to bring up around the um, cogeneration plant at ROPEC. Um, and so right now, um, we commissioned a biogas study that was identified in, in phase one of energy evolution. Um, has that been completed yet? Uh, Chair, no, it hasn't. Uh, the terms of reference are done. It was delayed uh, for a number of reasons. We expect to uh, start the study this, this year, uh, I think Q1 2019. Okay, so we, ha we haven't done, finished that yet, but we are in the budget recommending, I think, a $7.4 million spend on a new co a new co generation at at ROPEC. Um, the reason the reason I raise this is there may be some risks associated with going ahead with that particular item, um, particularly when we could actually lower our potential emissions uh, and and save money by by completing that study and looking at renewable natural gas uh, as an output uh, in ROPEC. And so. 7.4 million is is, uh, is a big spend. I I think it's it's fine to say let's reserve that in the budget. But saying we're going to do this with cogen, I think, is putting the cart before the horse. Can you just comment on the risk of that? Uh, well, currently we have engines at Ropec that are well past end of life, so that's a risk to the corporation. 
uh, and would require us to go back on the grid fully for ROPEC, which is probably one of the biggest energy users that we have. Uh, also, we are, uh, have a lost opportunity because we are flaring gas at the plant as well. So the Cogen project is going, not just going to replace the end-of-life uh, engines, but also will add engines to make ROPEC fully, uh, uh, fully um, off the grid. If I can uh, just a point on the um, on the biogas utilization study, that's that's not just ROPEC, that's citywide. So we're looking at sources citywide. So I don't think that uh, replacing those cogen engines at ROPEC will preclude anything we do in that study. Um, and I guess the last piece is we were and we still are in discussions with Enbridge about. Uh, some kind of arrangement at ROPEC, but with the change in the provincial government, uh, those, uh, those discussions stalled almost to a, a abrupt halt. So I'm not sure if there's even, even if we were to make a decision about uh, ROPEC, if there would be any way to move forward on that. Yeah, I th and I think the concern is you don't want to spend this money now to have something come back that the study tells us later, actually we should be using this for Renewable, renewable natural gas uh, as inputs for, for residents. And so I also noticed that at Q2 in our, in our discussions in Environment Committee here, we have a cogeneration plant update then, uh, so after, after the budget. Um, and so, and, and I mean, the, the biogas study that was in Energy Evolution, I think if i reading materials correctly, uh, was directly related um, to ROPA. Well, it might be helpful, uh, Chairs, if uh, the Councillor and staff could get together for a quick briefing. There was a business case that was developed uh, for the COGEN, and we can lay that out for the Councillor and, and any other direction going forward. Yeah, it would be good to discuss it. And I, I just want to be clear, I'm not um, worried about us earmarking some funds to have an upgrade at that facility. I just want to make sure we're not upgrading the facility with something that we say, hey, the recommendation is actually that we do this instead, but we're going ahead with that. So in the budget, it states the 7.4 million, that's fine, but the piece of it, uh, the actual uh, language around what that is going to be allocated towards, I think needs to be held off until we receive the, the study and the, the update in, in Q2, uh, which comes after, after the budget. Well, I suggest that you try to meet with staff between now and March 7th so that you can have that understanding before we get to every wall. We can all get on. Yeah, just want to make sure uh, we flagged it. Thanks, Chair. So that's uh, it for me on this side. All right, thank you. Councillor Meehan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question has to do with staffing. Um, because staffing, salaries, and benefits is one of the, um, the big line items on any budget, uh, I do have a question about the um, operating resource requirements uh, um, underneath the, I think it's the rate supported, or the tax supported budget, is calling for uh, seven full-time equivalents. And I understand, Mr. Willis, you were explaining uh, when Catherine was asking about, I think the, was it the climate change? Uh, can you just explain the, the seven full-time equivalents here? Certainly, uh, count, Chair, the, the Council's question relates to seven full-time equivalents in the asset management category under the maintenance of our water supply system, mm -hmm. that, which is separate from the energy evolution. The energy evolution resources we found from existing economic development and long-range planning staff. Seven, the specific jobs they are, is a senior engineer and infrastructure analyst uh, to deal with asset management plans for our major plants, our major treatment plants, pumping stations and reservoirs, two uh, senior project managers and two construction uh, technicians to deal with the fact that we've increased the capital program, so by spending more we actually need staff to deliver that increased capital program, and then uh, business analyst for our project management systems, which is one of the requirements coming out of the audit. These were issues that were identified in previous years in council. We actually had previous council directions on this, and we finally had the staff uh, keep the, re the ability to resource these things we were previously directed to do. Overall, in the um, entire budget in here, how many full-time uh, equivalents are we hiring? Right. Uh, so for planning infrastructure and economic development, the increased staffing levels are only seven more okay. for the entire department. All of the rest of the things we're doing are within the existing staff complements previously uh, approved by council. We're just redeploying people to areas of priority. Okay. And this uh, standing committee can approve that? Um, 
I'm going to ask the, the clerk's assistant on this. I think your mandate is we, we, we require your approval budget and, mm -hmm. and the council has previously set limits on FTE counts, if mm -hmm. I'm correct. Clerks can correct me if I'm wrong on this. So if we're increasing our complement, that's what we require your approval. Okay. Has anyone ever considered, um, I will, I will not ask that question here. Thank you. Um, just one other question though on um, the climate change. One of the things that I think we really haven't discussed is um, one of the impacts of climate change is we're seeing an increase in the ticks that are causing Lyme disease and Ottawa is now identified as a hot spot um, and it's actually much more of a problem than the parsnip. Are we talking at all about um, mitigating this problem? I mean wood chip, putting wood chips down along paths and things like that actually uh, can make a difference. There are like a 12 month problem. It's not just a summer problem right now. And uh, I, I foresee this as being a much more bigger problem than uh, that we, than we're actually realizing right now with serious consequences. So Mr. Chair, we're just looking to each other as who's the best position to do it. I know Ottawa Public Health is dealing with a program related to public awareness of ticks and how to manage them. That's a high focus. When the invasion of this invasive species is as widespread as it is, our experience of species is it's unlikely you're going to make it go away. What you need to do is, in, is further and further public awareness mm -hmm. because this has existed in the United States for, for a very, very long time and doing what they do in their area in terms of management practices and awareness is what we need to bring into this area because it is relatively new for us. I guess I, I hear the word need, Mr. Willis. Uh, yeah, we need it. Uh, how soon can we expect that you work with uh, the city's health department in order to get signs up to put some things down that will that help kids and, and dogs and, and, other, and, and adults um, you know, pr protect themselves as much as they possibly can. So Mr. Chair, since I'm not the subject matter expert on this and it isn't our department, my suggestion is we take the councillor's inquiry and we get you information either through a memo to council or a briefing from Ottawa Public Health and our colleagues in recreation who do the, do the management of the trails and pathways okay. and we'll get you additional information don't have that. Okay. I'm not the expert on that. Don't yeah. have that information. Okay, right I look forward to that. Thank you very much. Thank I, you, Mr. I, Chair. I can help with that as the yeah, chair of, good. of as the chair of the board also of public health. health. So, um, Mr. Willis is quite right that there's there's going to be uh, an enhanced outreach education outreach program going forward um, this year uh, with a number of new components over what we've done previously. Um, but I'm happy to, to reach out to the appropriate staff at Public Health and they can set up a meeting with you and run through the steps we're going to be taking. Thanks, Councillor. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Just on the staffing, I'm not sure where you're going exactly with the staffing thing. I know people talk about staffing, they talk about the amount of money that we spend on staffing at the City of Ottawa. Uh, they try to compare us to some private business. It, it's a ludicrous assessment. I mean, we've actually reduced staffing contingent at the City of Ottawa annually since 2012. From 2007 to 2011, I think we increased it by, those are the zero means zero years, uh, increased it by about 1,000 to 2,000 positions. That's when the city was run by someone who ran a business. Um, since then, it's gone down every single year. We reduced it by about 300 positions back in 2016 to the total savings of $20 million. You can only do that so much. Um, we run as a customer service driven business. Any customer service driven business has at least 50% staff. You don't go to a restaurant and say, wow, there's too many servers, too many bartenders here. You need them to provide the service to you. So any notion that the city should be spending less than 50 to 60% on staff would be a city that doesn't provide service to its constituents. Uh, so I, I've never understood that, that comparison, but I do hear from time to time that we, we're hiring too many people. Um, we need these people to run the services that we need at the city. Uh, do we have any other questions for staff? I had a list here, but we've gone through it. Uh, none. So I think any questions I had were addressed um, by members of the committee. I do just have a motion. I'm actually just going to ask uh, Councilor Cloutier to move it on my behalf, but I will uh, speak to it uh, briefly. Um, I will so move. Yeah, so it's a, it's a motion on, on stormwater rates. So we, we hear a lot about stormwater rates in the budget. There's about eight pages. So. In, uh, in the budget, there's about eight pages worth of, of culvert replacements that directly come from stormwater services. We talked to, we heard Councillor Eichlaus speak about the phase in of the stormwater fee approved uh, two years ago, and it's in its third year in 2019. Um, 
It was very controversial. There's about 45,000 people that weren't previously paying uh, for stormwater in their taxes. Uh, we introduced the fee that that's uh, allowed that. 30,000 are in the rural area. Um, there's always a concern about how that fee goes up. Uh, we had a report last year that projected a 13% increase. Last year we, we lowered that to about 6%. Uh, this year it was projected to be 13% again. Um, the budget in front of us is actually at 10.8%. I just have a motion here that will reduce that slightly further. So I'll just read it out. So whereas on February 19th, 2019, the Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management Committee is considering the draft 2019 rate supported services operating capital budgets. And whereas the stormwater services budget includes an overall revenue increase of 13% to cover the cost of the full capital and operating stormwater services program, approved in a long range financial plan for rate supported services. And whereas the recommended 13% revenue increase to cover the cost, uh, sorry, to cover program costs will result in an increase of 10.8% for stormwater rate payers. And whereas staff, have advised that a 1% reduction in the stormwater rates could be achieved if the stormwater services budget was re reduced by $410,000. And where our staff has advised that a reduction of $410,000 in the overall stormwater capital program could be accommodated without a major impact in stormwater services. Therefore, be it resolved that the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management recommend Council approve that the planned capital investment in stormwater services, PG, in the rate supported budget book, uh, be reduced by $410,000 with the result that the 2018 stormwater rate increase would be 9.8% and that staff be directed to amend the, the rates on page 21 to reflect that change. So essentially what this really means is that 9.8% is like $4. Um, it's a very small amount. It's really the principle of, of the increase from what we had sold the residents two years ago when we were introducing the fee in the first place. Um, we had a phase in for a reason. It was phased in to get used to the fact that you're paying for something that you hadn't previously been. Um, it still benefits the rural area to a great degree. I mentioned uh, it's page 76 in the rate budget, $12.7 million worth of culverts being renewed primarily in wards 19, 20, 21, and 5. That's the four rural wards. Um, the total amount collected by that stormwater fee in the rural area last year was a million dollars. Um, so for urban residents, don't do the math on that. Uh, for rural residents, do the math. It actually benefits you greatly uh, in terms of what we get from that fee for what we're paying for uh, versus the, the impact. Uh, for a lot of the projects that we see coming out of the transportation budget in order to renew our roads, the biggest thing that rural residents talk about is roads. Uh, please renew the roads. What we do before doing every single road is we go in there and replace all the culverts. The culverts come out of this project. So River Road, for instance, in Councillor Drews' ward south of Roger Stevens, uh, is slated to be renewed next year. This year we go in and replace five culverts. Without the stormwater fee associated with that stormwater fee, we don't replace those culverts, you don't get your new road. Uh, the reality is we have the two, we have the two here. Um, they, they work together, these two budgets, but they, they are separate uh, for a reason. Uh, but we, we do require this, and it's unfortunate the way it was set up for 15 years and that it was wrong and that it should have never happened that way prior, uh, post amalgamation. But we are here today so to bring that forward. It, it does uh, bring it down below a double digit increase. We have a report coming, I think, this year to talk more about where we go with stormwater infrastructure uh, in the long range financial plan. I think what's the long range financial plan six we got coming up? Yes? Um, so we're going to talk about it a bit more. But I just wanted to put that forward on the floor. Uh, we'll deal with that when we go through the, the uh, budget uh, approval in the roadmap. Uh, any questions on that, on that uh, motion? Councillor DeRuz? Uh, uh, Common, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. I know that we've been working hard on that file. But since you've been changing the names of this committee and you were able to achieve it, I think it will be very wise for us to change the name of that tax the storm water fee on those bills to really what we do in the rural area. You change culvert, and that's basically what you do. But you do not show and demonstrate to the resident what you do with that money when you tell them storm water. There is so major confusion between changing culvert and their laneways, we call it the private approach, or we, and uh, the regular uh, culvert that they come from the road department. So we, got, and then we have the municipal drain. There is so many confusion already in the rural area where we actually collect user fee and rates, and I think this is need to be addressed. 
That's just come. I yeah, there's a different point. I need to talk to staff about that a bit more because the reality is the stormwater fee comes up on your tax bills, but it shows up on those 45,000 tax bills, and 30,000 are rural. So there's 15,000 in the urban area, for instance, in the Council Regalized Ward, that would come up on those bills as well. It, what further adds to confusion is the way we listed in the budget as being rural, non-connected, urban, non-connected. Not connected to what? Because how the rain falls on your property doesn't you flush your toilet. So who cares if I'm connected to water and sewer? Who cares if I'm connected to well and septic? Being connected to something has nothing to do with stormwater. Um, so yeah, we, we've done a poor job of explaining this to residents. I still get the emails, when's the city going to come and maintain my septic system? We're never going to maintain your septic system. We're never going to charge you to maintain your septic system because it's yours, not ours. Um, it, it's, it, there's this constant stake in how we associate stormwater to the rest of our rate budget uh, is, is causing this constant confusion. On the stormwater fee, the name of it, how you could address that better on the tax bill, I'm not sure because it does pay for more than just culverts. It pays for stormwater ponds. It pays for different things in the urban area as well as the rural area. I mean, one of the biggest issues for years was that parking lots would pay zero. We'd have these mass parking lots in the urban area that would pay absolutely zero towards stormwater, yet it's 100% runoff. Uh, so they're now paying this stormwater fee as well. I mean, look in the look in the ICNI section of this uh, of this report. They pay they pay quite a bit. Um, how we could address that better and show up on a tax bill to make it more um, obvious to residents what they're paying for? I don't know. I mean, it could take a further discussion, and we can talk about that. I know that stormwater fee is a four-letter word in the world, um, but we'll, maybe we can we can work on that and address it better uh, going forward. I, I think it's a, we have a perfect time right now to maybe address it internally just with staff and talk about yeah. it, but I sure. think we should change it. Thank sure. you. I think you want to change it to zero is what you want to change to. Uh, Councillor Brockinson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just a question, something you talked about um, that, that will perhaps me to supporting this and that was when the consultations were happening in the various uh, rural communities were residents told that the rate would be capped at a certain level are, are you trying to get it down below a certain threshold based on what was communicated to people so i can understand this a bit better so it was never it was never indicated to residents that it'd be capped uh, we, we said it'd be phased in over four years we had a projected 2016 rates that would be phased in over over four years. Um, I think the expectation was that previously it had gone up 5% annually and that that would continue. Of course, once we got into the 2018 budget cycle, that was not the projection. Uh, in fact, I guess um, when you pulled apart the three budgets and you looked at what was, it's a 5% it's a blended rate. So for, the, for everyone who's, who pays that rate and has for years, it's 5%. But once you pull them apart and you raise them up, uh, storm sewer and water go up by about 4.5 percent but once you pull off storm water it's actually it's much higher it's the blending of the three together that creates the five percent since someone like myself doesn't pay for water and sewer i don't have that blended uh rate so i have the higher percentage it's just trying to bring it back into a point where residents expected it to be which is in that five to six percent range obviously we're not there but it's closer to and yet we still get the benefit of what what the rate is supposed to achieve and what the budget does. Okay, can I just ask staff, with $410,000 less, what is going to be impacted? Chair, sure. what we're looking at are basically some of the studies, so it's not the capital works that are actually going to construction that are going to be impacted, so it's mainly studies. Any other questions? No, thank you. Okay, right, can I ask that uh, Councillor Menard uh, move the two roadmap budget, uh, the budget, the roadmap budget motions, please? Yes, Mr. Chair. So that the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water, and Waste Management recommends that Council, sitting as Committee of the Whole, approve the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water, and Waste Management 2019 tax supported draft operating and capital budget. Uh, as follows, one, infrastructure services, as follows, user fees, page nine, B, operating resource requirement, page eight, two, resiliency and natural systems policy, operating requirement, page 10, solid waste services, as follows, 
user fees, page nine, uh, excuse me, user fees, page 12 to 13, operating resource requirements, page 11, forestry services as follows, user fees, page 15, operating resource requirement, page 14, standing community and environmental protection, water and waste management capital budget, page 16. Okay, and there's a second one here, Mr. Mr. Chair, you want that as well? Yes, bring it Okay. That the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection and Water Waste Management recommends that Council sitting as Committee of the Whole approve the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection and Water and Waste Management 2019 rate supported draft operating and capital budget, including amended pages 23 to 25B and 115 to 119B. As follows, drinking water services as follows, user fees and operating resource requirement, water services as follows, the user fees and the operating resource requirement, and the stormwater services as follows, user fees and operating resource requirements. The Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management Rate Supported Capital Budget, page 2325 as amended, and the individual projects listed on page 39 to 64, 66 to 69, 71 to 92, and 94 to 114. So moved. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So we'll run through that, um, and we'll just uh, go through each item individually. So on the tax supported budgets, uh, one, infrastructure services, A, user fees, and B, operating requirements. Operating resource requirements, page nine and eight. Is that carried? Carried. Uh, number two, resiliency and natural systems policy, operating resource requirement, page 10. Is that carried? Carried. I'll just keep on going through anyways. It's the, way it's, it's the way it's laid out, so I don't want to cheat the system by just approving the whole thing one fell swoop. Maybe someone will have something to say halfway through. You didn't think of before, who knows. Number three, solid waste services as follows. User fees, uh, page 12 to 13, and operating resource requirements, page 11. Carried. Carried. Number four, forestry services as follows. User fees, page 15. Operating resource requirement, page 14. Carried. And five, standing committee on environment protection, water and waste management, capital budget, page 16. Carried. carried. So that whole thing is carried on the tax supported draft operating capital budget. On to the rate budget, which was already amended earlier by a technical motion. Um, so, one, drinking water services as follows A, user fees, page 9 to 13. B, operating resource requirement, page 8. Carried. Carried. Thank you. Item two, wastewater services as follows. A, user fees, page 15 to 17. B, operating user requirement, page 14. Carried. Three, stormwater services. This is where the, uh, so A would be user fees, 19 to 22. B would be operating resource requirements, page 18. This is where the motion for the stormwater rates uh, would come in. So that motion as moved by Councillor Cloutier, is that item carried? Carried. Yes, dissent from Councillor Brockington on the motion, on number three as a whole with A and B. Carried. Carried. And four, the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management, rate supported capital budgets as amended. Is that carried? Carried. Carried. So we're good, so the whole budget's approved. Fantastic. All right, so we'll move on to item six, which was Oh, sorry, and this is the dividend motion, sorry. There's also a motion uh, from Councillor Edgar I move forward on the, the hydro dividend, which would look to contribute, to put any sort of surplus from the hydro dividend toward energy evolution and um, renewable sort of energy uh, projects within our committee's mandate uh, for this term of council. Is that item carried? Carried. Carried, thank you. All right, so that's it for item four. Again, uh, item six, which was the Urban Forest Management Plan uh, 2018 update and 2019 to 2022. Um, so we just want a quick presentation on that. We have Lila Gibbons and Martha Kopstick here to present to us on that item. This was, again, this was a report that was asked for from the previous term of council. And instead of just jamming it into the IPDs, I figured we'd actually, you know, get a presentation. Oh, and Geraldine Wildman's joining as well. Hello, Geraldine. Hi. 
And we have one speaker on this item. So we'll get to that after the presentation. And this is this item because it was lifted. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. My name is Martha Kopstake. I'm a forester in the Natural Systems and Rural Affairs Group of Planning, Infrastructure, and Economic Development. So in June 2017, Council approved Ottawa's first urban forest management plan, and at that time, staff were directed to report back to the new committee and council on the implementation of the plan and next steps uh, in Q1 2019. So here we are. We've prepared uh, a memo in IPD, as Councillor Moffat uh, indicated, and this short presentation will just summarize the, the memo before you. Okay, so putting down roots for the future is Ottawa's 20-year strategic urban forest management plan. It shapes the management of Ottawa's urban forest from 2018 to 2037. The plan includes 26 recommendations, basically our action plan moving forward, to be implemented within the first eight years of the plan. The plan provides guidance to achieve urban forest sustainability in Ottawa, and it supports the community's commitment to a continued and improved stewardship of our urban forest. The UFMP will be implemented jointly by the Natural Systems and Rural Affairs Group in PIDE and the Forest Management Unit in Public Works. So we've begun on the UFMP recommendations. We're now about one year in, and I'll briefly go over what we've been working on. So we're currently doing a comprehensive review of the tree bylaws. That includes the urban tree conservation bylaw for privately owned trees and the municipal trees and natural areas protection bylaw for city owned trees. This project will also include, or does also include, investigating the applicability of a heritage tree bylaw or a heritage tree program for Ottawa, also developing citywide tree compensation guidelines and formalizing incentives for tree conservation. Moving forward, staff in forestry have just completed a maintenance strategy for city-owned woodlots and forested areas. So this is our forested areas maintenance strategy. We're also working on an urban forest canopy cover study, which we're doing in partnership with the NCC and the city of Gatineau. And the first phase of this project will soon be complete. It will actually be presented in April at the NCC Capital Urbanism Lab at an event there. Uh, we've also completed the guidelines to implement the city's new significant woodlands policies, and these guidelines will be going to planning committee on February 28th. Staff have been working also on improving the process for the city assumption of trees and new developments. So this, this basically will ensure that newly planted trees and new subdivisions are added into the city's tree inventory in a more timely manner, and therefore become a part of the city's tree ma maintenance program in a more timely manner. And finally, we're also doing work on expanding awareness about the value of the urban forest internally through outreach and engagement. So moving forward, along with completing the projects that I just described, these are some of the items that are forecasted for our near-term work plan. So the first one, establish internal and external urban forestry working groups to facilitate communication on urban forestry issues. Develop a forest inventory collection and maintenance plan expand urban forest stewardship and develop an outreach and engagement strategy on, on, on stewardship, develop new and update, we'll be developing new and updating existing guidelines for tree planting. So this will include specific guidelines for tree planting in existing urban conditions, tree planting in hardscape scenarios, and also tree planting in greenfield areas. So there you go, that was pretty quick, but <laughs> that's our update for now, thank you. Great, no, appreciate uh, you taking the time uh, to provide that update for us. So we actually have two delegations now. So we're gonna move forward with that first. So Jennifer Humphreys, if you'd like to come forward, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on the Urban Forest Management Plan. I represent the Trees and Green Space focus of the Associations for Environmental Sustainability. It comprises about 50 community associations across the city, areas, not just urban, suburban, rural, etc. CAFES was engaged extensively in the consultations leading up to the UFMP. Members are deeply committed to seeing it come to full fruition. 
Much of the work of the UFMP is in the first four years, reflecting our wish and that of the city to plan now to ensure a strong and expansive tree canopy for the next generation. Along with my colleague, Daniel Buckles, I also represent the CAFE's interests on the external stakeholder group for the Tree Bylaw Review. In this capacity, Daniel and I recently participated in meetings with senior staff, including Stephen Willis and two city councillors. We were impressed by their dedication and openness. But, like our colleagues at Ecology Ottawa, CAFE's members are concerned that the UFMP is at risk. Despite staff assurances, the UFMP is clearly not on track due to significant delays in the tree bylaw review and the best practices guidelines. The bylaw review has been delayed by a year. Originally planned for completion in spring 2019, it will now be a full year later in 2020. The best practices guidelines for tree planting and establishment are nowhere near completion with small scale pilot projects just beginning. These are the delays we know about. Are there others? Numerous comments in the summary of the UFMP recommendations by city staff note that additional resources are required or additional resources may be required. This suggests a serious impending problem with delivery of the plan. Exactly how much additional resourcing is required if there is a serious intent to deliver, and this really is a priority, then why does the draft budget not have provisioning for UFMP implementation? We recommend that this committee direct staff to provide an estimate of additional budgetary requirements on a per deliverable basis for each recommendation of the first management period of the UFMP. We urge that this committee ask for this within one month in order that required resources can become part of the strategic initiatives process funding of the term of council priorities process. We know that the value of trees is understood at the highest levels of city administration. In January, in his State of the City address, Mayor Watson made special mention of trees. CAFE's members are pleased to see the mayor's commitment to plant 500,000 trees over the term of council focusing initially on communities hardest hit by the tornadoes of last December. We also appreciate the mayor's proposal to triple the penalties for tree removals to avoid what he termed oops moments. As the mayor suggests, trees are a critical part of our infrastructure, a key element of our efforts against climate change, and permitting them to fall prey to oops moments is foolish and wasteful. Unfortunately, too often in Ottawa, we see two factors working against achieving a critical mass of mid-sized and mature trees. The first factor is, as Mayor Watson stated, that trees are lost to development. Sometimes there's no choice but to remove one tree or many. But all too often, trees are removed because it is the easy path to construction without consideration to options that can allow the tree to stand or even to enhance the building project. Tree loss in the urban area continues at a rapid pace, undermining the sustainability and livability of the city and costing residents in the city possibly millions in environmental services. This is why we urgently need revised bylaws that take into account the environmental and sustainability role of trees. They're not just pretty, not just something that it's nice to have. The second factor is poor planting and establishment practices. We desperately need best practice planting guidelines. In planting the 500,000 saplings, we're making a substantial investment. That investment will yield huge returns, but only if we do it right to ensure the survival of those trees. We're in a climate change emergency, and we need to take emergency measures. The longer the review takes, the more mature trees are going to be lost that could have been protected under revised bylaws. Therefore, on behalf of CAFES, I urge you to provide additional resources to UFMP implementation in the order of $100,000 to support at least one new staff position this year. 
This position should be assigned to assist in accelerating the bylaw review process and moving forward urgently the development of best practice planting and establishment guidelines. Lastly, lastly, we are concerned that the update document proposes to next update this committee and the public on process in 2022. That is three years from now. We ask that this committee direct staff to provide annual updates so that you can ensure that the implementation of the UFMP really is on track. We also urge that implementation updates be provided as items for discussion and subject to comment from public delegations by active citizenry. In our view, providing documents and reports as information previously distributed is not good practice from the point of view of transparency and public accountability. All right, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to take, I, I, I thought you were wrapping up about a minute ago, so you're about to Thank six, you. Six, I just wanted to doors. thank you for the time. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of CAFES. All right, no worries. Any questions for the delegation? Yeah, just, Councilman Menard? Just very quickly, uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, we've, we've met on this issue and had a uh, good opportunity to have um, a discussion. You're asking for $100,000 uh, to fund at least the, the one FTE to start to implement uh, this. That seems very reasonable to me. I think in the past you've made some suggestions about where that could come from. Things like, um, you know, ch charging more for taking trees down in terms of the permitting system. Are there ideas that you have in terms of um, where that funding could come from? Well, that's a really good place to start. Um, the mayor has suggested tripling compensation fees. Um, when tree removals are done without authorization and so on. Um, uh, there is provision in the current bylaw to add uh, fees up a notch, maybe not triple. Um, I think that uh, consideration and, and my colleagues from the, the staff, and I want to reiterate that the staff are us and, and committed and are working really hard. There just isn't enough of them. There just aren't enough people doing this. Um, so I think that there is a provision there within, and if, if the current bylaws could be um, you know, more stringently enforced, it's, it, in the UFMP there's a talk about boots on the ground. We don't have the boots on the ground. Uh, did, did you know that, for example, um, if someone um, uh, spots a, a neighbor um, or, or a developer cutting down a tree and it's a weekend and the general manager is not available to come over and, and issue a, a requirement you stop now, uh, it doesn't happen. It, you know, there's just, and there's just not enough people to, to go out and do those things. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your time. Our next speaker, many of us have seen him here before, uh, Jason Garlow with uh, Hidden Harvest Ottawa. his presentation, so thanks to the trusty Matt Ostigi for getting us going here. The very unheralded Matt Ostigi, that's why I wanted to make sure I mentioned his name. <laughs> uh, all right, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. I guess I'll start from the top. Go to my notes. Uh, so Hidden Harvest uh, is a project of Tides Canada's shared platform and, and our mission is that we want to live in a fruit tree friendly city where everyone is empowered to access, share and, and make full use of, of the fruit and nuts growing in plain sight. Um, we're here today to speak uh, to the importance of providing the resources required um, to achieve the recommendations of the Urban Forest Management Plan. Uh, city staff and stakeholders such as us uh, have invested a lot of time, thought, and resources towards developing these uh, recommendations and actions. Uh, there's a lot of great actions planned for the first management period over this term of council, uh, and some of the actions don't even require a lot of money, uh, like, like uh, recommendation number two, creating some uh, urban forestry both internal and external. Uh, there's an old saying, uh, sort of relates to this, best time to start an external urban forestry working group was 20 years ago. The second best time to start uh, an er external er urban forestry working group is today. I think it's a Chinese proverb or something like that. But first a bit uh, more on us. Uh, 
so show of hands, how many people here have heard of picking uh, a hidden harvest? You can make a picking motion in like off season. Yeah, that's great, there's some people back there. Off season's a great time to, to do some exercises in calisthenics. Um, so that's good. Uh, so I can make the presentation shorter, that's awesome. Uh, basically, if you saw us on the street, this is us. It's a group of four to five volunteers meeting under the shade of a, a tree for an hour or two to pick, sort, and share fruit and nuts. Um, and for the benefit of the new council members and, and the new people in the gallery that haven't heard of us before, um, it's not just apples and pears. We're also harvesting and sharing service berries, cherries, plums, grapes, apricots, elderberries, hazelnut, walnuts, the list goes on. It's all items from trees and shrubs that would otherwise go to waste on public property. Um, so this past year, we harvested about six, uh, enough food to reach uh, more than 6,000 mouths here in our community. Um, and we share four ways. So the best stuff, the highest quality, goes to the, uh, the, at least one quarter goes to the nearest food bank in need, uh, one quarter shared with the volunteers, a quarter shared with the homeowners. In, in the case of the, the, the landowner or homeowner being the city of Ottawa, we divert that extra bit to the, the local nearest food bank that could use it. Um, and then a quarter goes to the local businesses. And we have business relationships with almost every single one of your wards on this committee. Uh, we're working with Michael Dolce uh, Jams, we have uh, uh, Bicycle Craft Brewery, we have uh, relationships with uh, the Mary dairy, um, Top Shelf Preserves, so many great local businesses that and restaurants that love making use of this local food. Um, we also make use of the city's green bin program and any bad apples or yard waste that our volunteers are cleaning up are also diverted to the residential organic program to increase the tonnage going to Orga World. Um, so, uh, Councilor Menard, this is your award. Um, this, this is child labor and training. Uh, it's a daycare learning how to use uh, one of our picker poles uh, at an orchard in the city. Um, so we also do, that slide is there because we do workshops and outreach and things like that as well. Um, it doesn't always have to be the counselors uh, telling the people what to do. Uh, often the community groups are well positioned, nonprofits, to leverage funding uh, to make good uh, investments. But I'm not here to talk about that today. I'm here to talk about resourcing the low hanging fruit. Uh, there's some great opportunities in this plan uh, that would be a shame uh, to let fall on the ground without getting funding. Uh, in particular, uh, creating a staff position focused on facilitating the communication, engagement, and stewardship. Um, means that, that means that the forestry department will be better prepared to feed the growing hunger that we're seeing on the ground. We're seeing a lot of community, uh, a lot of citizens in different neighborhoods, a lot of our volunteers, a lot of organizations we work with that, that have a growing hunger to learn and engage uh, with urban trees and urban forests. Uh, and. Um, and there's a huge opportunity to take, take advantage of that, um, but uh, right now there's no single staff person dedicated to, to doing all of that. Um, the, also understanding your tree canopy and developing an urban forest inventory collection and maintenance plan are also small steps that can have a huge impact in the long run. We heard from, from some of the past speakers in the delegation saying like, well, what, what are the budget numbers for these action items for uh, your, your uh, energy plan? Um, that transparency we found, um, such as when the, the forestry services opened up on open data, uh, the tree inventory, that's empowered a lot of the food banks to say, wait, there's apple trees like two blocks from our food bank? We had no idea. And, and that's empowering them to take action, not leaving it to the city's budget to hire someone to harvest those apples so they don't get picked up by a street sweeper. Um, it's empowering our communities to take that action. So by you guys having a better knowledge of what your assets, inventory, and canopy is, it empowers organizations such as ours to, to recommend where good tree planting opportunities would be. So I, all in all, I think that's it. Uh, we'd like to thank Forestry Services and the, the work of other staff and stakeholders for the tremendous effort, uh, tremendous effort, I didn't read that properly, they put into this plan and we're really rooting for all these actions to get off the ground sooner rather than later um, and with the full support of this committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think the real takeaway is that Councilor Menard permits child labor in his ward. <laughs> I'm quite disgusted Just by this. Um, all right, thank you. Is there any questions for the delegation? Oh, thank you. I appreciate your, you're always enthusiastic when you come. Uh, previously, I think you've come to Transportation Committee. Have you, has it been? You've been to some committees before, I can remember. But it's very much appreciated. I'm not on CPS, so I have no idea. He was, I didn't see him there. All right, um, any questions for staff on this item? 
Cancer. Yes. Unless you have a question for me. Cancer Dragler? So I'll, I'll start with the simple one. What's a heritage tree? What's, what's the definition of a heritage tree? You talked about creating a designation, so what would that mean? So that's what we need to determine for Ottawa. So there are several other municipalities. We haven't done, we, we actually have somebody doing some research right now for us on um, various aspects of this, but one of them is on uh, heritage bylaws, heritage programs in other municipalities. So we have to determine that for Ottawa. So that's what we'll be doing as a part of this bylaw review project. Okay. Um, and one of your slides spoke to an external working group that's as a future project. So my understanding is you already sort of had that in place. So I'm a little confused by that. Yeah, through you, Chair. That, so basically one of the recommendations of the Urban Forest Management Plan was to create sort of a permanent set of working groups, so an internal and external urban forestry working group that we sort of engage with on a regular basis over time. Currently, because we've been using our time to work on the urban, uh, sorry, the tree bylaw review, and the tree bylaw review does have an internal and external uh, sort of stakeholder group as a right. part of that. So we've been focusing our time on on working with them, and will be moving forward. And then the next step would be to create these more permanent working groups that we use to um, consult with and uh, engage with future over time. Okay, thanks, Claire. Okay, because I know you've been out in the community, you've been in my community certainly, and, and have had uh, participation from the Glens, for example, so I was a little confused when you said that was a, a future project. Um, and so we, we've heard a lot about funding and staffing. So I see in front of me three very capable staff work with each and every one of you uh, on a variety of, of projects. So. Um, and I understand you all have other responsibilities um, within your portfolios, but can you sort of break down quickly what it is that you do, if, if you know what I mean? Um, so we, again, we're hearing that we need extra staff, so if we're going to talk about that or even contemplate that, I think we need to understand exactly what it is you do and whether you feel there are any gaps that need to be filled. Chair, through you, thank you for your question. Um, right now we do have Martha who works full time primarily on the Urban Forestry Management Plan, my group, and I'll leave it to Lila to talk um, about her pieces a little bit further. What I would like to caution is I'm not sure that an additional staff person on the Urban Forestry, um, on the bylaws per se, would, would significantly speed things up. There's still a process that we're dealing with here. So we're working on, um, you know, internal conversations, we're still ideating, we're working with industry, we have stakeholder groups, there's a positions paper that's going to be coming forward very shortly. So there are a bunch of things that need to happen, uh, regardless of whether or not we have Martha or an additional person. And what we have done is we've supplemented Martha where she requires some support. So as indicated, we are looking at best practices, we want the best thinking available, we're going to put a little bit of money behind that to help supplement us so that we're saying the right things. I'm not saying that we don't need additional resources, but I'm going to turn it over to Lila where she has some uh, additional priorities where I think re we could benefit from those resources. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Geraldine. Uh, through the chair, uh, so we work closely, so Public Works Environmental Services Forestry Management works closely with our partners in planning um, on this program. Uh, the first management period of the Urban Forest Management Plan requires a lot of one-time funding in order to complete uh, things like the city's tree inventory, uh, development of a tree planting prioritiz prioritization tool, and the completion of a tree uh, manual. So this doesn't ask for an increase in our uh, operating budgets. It is one-time funding. Um, as Ms. Humphreys has also mentioned earlier, is uh, there are some resource requirements that will be coming forward. Um, we're looking uh, at two FTEs uh, for education outreach and another one for, uh, so one for education outreach and another for management of uh, tree inventory and master data. Um, this will be coming forward later this year. Uh, we'll be coming forward to council with a, uh, a budget plan for council and we're hoping uh, that uh, council will see this through their, uh, their priority process. So just a quick, couple of quick follow-ups. So the two additional FTEs that you're going to come forward with a little bit later, when do you anticipate they would be starting? We 
would prefer that they start as soon as possible, but as we go through uh, working, we, and uh, we do, can't forget the fact that we are working through a number of programs in the Urban Forest Management Plan. Um, these pieces will assist to lay the foundation. Um, if we get them this year, uh, it's a benefit. We're trying to, to look in our own resources, how we can create temporary uh, FTEs uh, in order to accommodate that portion this year, but again, it'll be coming through later um, and through hopefully to be considered through council priorities. So a 2020 ask. So are you concerned that if it's not in the budget that we just approved today, um, that there'd be a difficulty in getting wanted to get someone going even on a temporary basis uh, this year? Uh, we're doing a clean, uh, we're going through each of our budget lines uh, quite extensively to see if there is some additional funding from ongoing projects and initiatives that we can maybe divert this year in order to assist. It's not uh, something that we can sustain year after year, but we are definitely taking, we know how important this program is and how to set these foundations uh, now. So we will be doing a, uh, a closer look at how we can maybe re-divert some funds this year in order to make sure that we still go uh, forward with these uh, recommendations. So when you bring forward to the reported recommendation for the additional FTE and what they're going to be doing, you also bring forward a plan at that time as to how you intend to fund it? Uh, we, the plan that we'll be coming to, uh, to council with later this year will be more for the rest of this term of council uh, to set a budget so, so that we're aware what we can expect and can see through this next term of budget. Uh, we can come back uh, with a plan on how we can find enough funds to make sure that we do the tree inventory, which we're looking at to complete in 2019 for our parks, and then again in 2024 our woodlot uh, areas. Okay, and then uh, just the last follow-up is, um, we've heard about delays within the bylaw process or review process. Um, First of all, two questions. Uh, in addition to the three of you, I'm assuming that there's at least one person in bylaw working on this as well. From an operational perspective, or no? Yeah, we, we, were, we do have somebody from bylaw services who's sort of on our staff team working on this, but we, you know, we aren't at the point where we're drafting a bylaw yet, so they will be engaged more as we move forward but yes there is somebody on our team but they at this point framing the issues synthesizing the problems all of that they're playing a lower role than they will be as we move forward and in your collective opinion is there anything that this committee can do either by way of motion or direction to to deal with i i forget exactly how you put it operational issues or, or procedural, is there anything we can do, anything we can direct, anything we can move that help push this process forward? I think we're at the point now where we're, we're doing well, we're, you know, we're moving, we're moving things forward, we have a good plan in place. Um, the timeline for the tree bylaw review is such that we will be uh, completing it within this year. And so by the end of 2019, we'll, staff will have our recommendations in, in place, and then we will be basically putting everything together, putting it into a report form, making our recommendations coming to this committee, so coming to you very early next year. And at this point, I think we're in a good place moving forward. As Geraldine uh, mentioned and I mentioned earlier, we have somebody um, a, as a consultant doing some uh, background work for us as we do more of the developing of our issues and positions paper, which is coming out to our, um, our stakeholders in probably June. So I guess the answer is that we're in a good place now to move things forward. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you very much, Councillor Egwin, Councillor McKinney. Thank you, Chair. Um, so I, I do want to recognize how hard staff work, and uh, this has been, uh, you know, the uh, UFMP on the whole, I, you know, wholly supported it, and I know that uh, staff do everything that they can, but you don't have the resources you need. We're at least a year behind on a tree bylaw uh, review. Um, was uh, brought to us in 2017. Now we're looking at 2019, 2020 uh, before we really start to stop trees from being taken down. And that's the crux of it, right? Because, um, so in my ward, uh, which is the downtown ward, and if you look out there, there aren't many trees, and at least once a week, 
at least once a week. Um, and I've started to compile them, actually. I get an email either from staff, from a developer, from a contractor, um, with a really good reason why a tree or several trees have to come down in the downtown. And it's always, to them, a very good reason. Um, we're building a new library. We're changing, the, we're realigning uh, Albert Street. And staff have uh, recommended that two wonderful rows of trees come down on Albert Street that are about 15 years mature now. Um, it happens all the time. Um, I like bike lanes. I think that cycling infrastructure, I think sidewalks are really great. I think affordable housing is like key to a, a healthy city, but uh, breathing is the most important thing. And it just is. And when we build bike lanes and take down the trees, um, it means that you don't breathe clean air. We breathe dirty air. And, uh, and it's, it's probably the biggest frustration that I have as a city councilor for the downtown, as a resident in the downtown, is how we treat our trees and how we, you know, we talk about putting down roots. For me, it's about saving the roots. It's about saving what we have and ensuring that uh, there are real, true consequences to, to pulling down trees. So when I look at this, um, again, recognizing that staff, you know, the staff that we have do, do the best job that they do with the resources we give you. But it's our responsibility as council and as councillors to give you the resources you need, and we have not done that. We have not done that because we passed this in 2017, it's now 2019, it'll be 2020 before we actually start taking any real um, uh, action towards saving trees. Uh, and if I look at the summary of your recommendations, um, I see additional resources required, additional resources maybe, they are, they may be, they are, they are, they are. Like, all through here, we can see additional resources required for staffing um, on, I think, 14, 15 of the, the 26 recommendations. So um, I'm having a really hard time understanding how we could be sitting here uh, without any recommendations for staffing. So uh, going into, I'm not going to do it today because it would be doing it on the fly and it would be doing it under nothing but frustration. Um, but I, I am, you know, we, we have to think seriously about how we move forward. And I, quite frankly, am not prepared not to staff. I think that, you know, we've dealt with these artificial tax caps for so long that this is where it's left us. It has left us with you up there going, we're doing the best we can. And you know what, you are. But we haven't given you the resources to do better. And we haven't given you the resources to ensure that trees in our city are protected, that we are doing everything we can. We sit here, we talk about climate change, we talk about living healthy lives, we've got a new official plan that we're about to get into that will make us a livable city, and we are not moving forward on, on protecting our tree canopy and understanding what the best practices are. So uh, I guess I don't have any other questions. I know what you need. Um, I've just answered it, so um, more to come, I guess, at council, but it is, uh, it is s such a frustration. Thank you. So we're discussing breathing at this community is actually out of order. That's actually for a lot of public health. It's not in our, I don't remember seeing breathing in our terms of reference, Councillor McKinney. Um, any other questions, Councillor McKinney? I know you mentioned that you wanted to. Thanks, Jeff. Just very quickly, um, the, ti the timeline for coming back to this committee, I wanted, I wanted to touch on that too, because I've met with you separately as well, but um, it seems to indicate there's UFMP 2022, there's a report back to council, but the items that are um, flagged within that um, looks like there is, the Urban Forest Canopy Cover Study 2020, the Tree Bylaw Review 2020, and the Significant Woodlands 2019. When those are when those are completed, do they come back to us to for implementation? Does that work? Well, yeah. For instance, let's go with the Tree Bylaw Review as an example. So when we once we bring that forward, um, as we've indicated in the full UFMP. We imagine that resources may be required in order to implement what we're going to propose um, when we come back and so then we would have to navigate that at that time. 
So our report back to you would either indicate resources then or it would be planned through budget. Okay, so on those individual items though, we'll get a report sooner than 2022. We'll get it when you've, you're done the work to, uh, to bring it back to us and then there's a potential request for uh, resources then to implement. Yep, through you, Chair, exactly. Yep. With, with those bigger items, we will come back to this committee um, and, and report back. The report that comes back in 2022 is sort of the, it's the, it's the time where, you know, we didn't get into the, you know, the nitty gritty of how this UFMP works, but basically it's the time where we're going to be reporting back on what we accomplished in the first management period. We also are going to be looking at our um, monitoring matrix that we have and uh, reassessing how we're doing. We did that as a baseline assessment, so we're we'll reassessing, reporting back on that. And then we'll be talking about what we plan to do for the next management period, which is mostly already laid out in the UFMP. But one thing we need to do is assess um, new challenges and new opportunities kind of have an adaptive management framework where we can also bring those into it to move forward. So that's the report in 2022. That's not saying that on our individual items that we're doing, we won't be okay. coming back here. Yeah, because the work you do is very important to, to I mean, my ward, but right across the city. Uh, you know, you heard the, the mayor's comments around uh, the, uh, I guess, the state of the city uh, speech and uh, it seemed to put, place some importance on it there. So I'm hoping that the term of council priorities provides further, um, I guess, investment in this as a priority uh, when we come down to that. So I don't know exactly the month that we're going to be deciding that on, but when that comes, I hope members of this committee will be uh, in favor of this as a term of council priority for us uh, when it does come to us. So thank you. Thank you. So there's no item to receive or anything. So thank you for the presentation. Appreciate you coming and, uh, and doing that for us. That's it for the agenda. Notices of motion. Councilor Menard has a notice of motion that he already mentioned earlier. I did. I did. I, yeah. <laughs> included that. Sorry, uh, Chair. So thanks very much. Um, the notice of motion is whereas climate change and environmental degradation pose an ex existential threat to the City of Ottawa, whereas the City is attempting to reduce the amount of waste that is shipped to municipal landfills, and whereas the reliance on single-use plastics is a significant contributor to waste in landfills and environmental degradation. And Canada and the world are looking into means of reducing or eliminating reliance on single-use plastics and where city staff are currently developing a new waste management roadmap and whereas the city has not yet provided studies or data to demonstrate the amount of contamination of compost the introduction of plastic bags to the green bin will produce nor how the introduction of plastic bags to the green bin will affect the usage rates of single-use plastic bags and whereas other means of increasing the green bin participation rate, including but not limited to in, in introducing green bins to more apartment buildings, conducting extensive public education campaigns, limiting the number of garbage bags a resident may have collected without additional cost, or a combination thereof have not been fully explored or implemented, therefore be it resolved that the City of Ottawa refrain from the introduction of single-use bags into the green bin until such a time that research into the effect of introducing single-use plastic bags to the green bin have been presented and fully considered by the Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management. Thanks. Thank you. So we'll discuss that in April. No other notices of motion, inquiries, Councillor Cloutier. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Et puis, um, I had, um, I guess this might be from Ms. Gibbons. Um, just like to get um on, it's, it's just an inquiry so you have to come up. yeah just an inquiry and uh, i'll send it to you by by email uh, with respect to in the hope that spring will come in the hope that spring will come and the amount of snow that we've received just want to uh, get, get an assessment by staff of the flooding risk in the urban area and the rural area and uh, what staff can do now to mitigate what we can ask our residents to do now to mitigate that that risk and um, information on further action in the spring and if there's any educational material that is available for our residents so that um, fast thaw that uh, we could reduce the risk of flooding in our homes thank you thank you chair thank you councillor mckinney Thank you, Chair. It's a four-parter. Um, first, are plastic bottles used in City Hall and other city buildings for any city purposes? Um, what is the length of the contract 
tax and the annual revenue from contracts with Coca-Cola and any other suppliers the city has uh, contracts with, whereas the revenue from these contracts contracts directed to in the city's budget, what is the, uh, I guess it's a five-pointer. Um, <laughs> Sorry, you said four points, so it's got to stick to four to get rid of one of your points. <laughs> what is the revenue generated from all contracts that includes uh, the sale and or use of uh, single-use plastic bottles? And what is the annual budget for the water department to promote uh, city water? Thank you. Any other inquiries? Councillor Fleury, no, no other inquiries. Um, sorry, that's just a joke because he has a lot of inquiries. Uh, other business? None. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, April 16th. Thank you, Jerry. Feels like forever away, eh? Tuesday, April, like April 16th. Feels like